as I want to call out the limited edition apparel, the link is in the description. As I've spoken about before, the limited edition apparel is apparel that I basically come up with. So some of the designs suck, some of them not so much. It's a weird thing. The ones that I think are going to do really well usually don't. The ones I think aren't going to do really well do really well. Either way, they're all limited runs, so it changes, you know, every single month. But all limited edition items are tri-blend material with, you know, the cut that everybody wants now that's a little bit tighter on their arms so they can show off how big their fucking arms are. The limited edition items directly support the podcast. So head over, pick up your shirt today. Could be a hoodie, could be shorts. We got these ball hugger shorts right now, which I would never wear, but I was told they were super popular, but you know what? They were wrong because they're still sitting there and I probably should discount them right now. Anyhow, if you want to see the discount on the ball hugger shorts, head over, over, over to the limited edition apparel, link in the description box. The Swiss Symposium 2023. Yes, we are bringing this back to Columbus again. The date is October 20 and 21. Columbus, Ohio, Hilton, it's the same location it was last year. If you head over to the website, there's a big banner that links directly to Swiss. There's also a link in the description box so you can see who the presenters are as we are booking them for the symposium. The symposium has been going on for 20 years. It's, in my opinion, probably a little biased, but in my opinion, one of the best symposiums when it comes to strength and conditioning, uh, sport medicine, therapy, physical therapy. Right now, the admission is 38% off or 48% off. It's I'm don't know. I'm not looking. I'm just kind of looking at the camera right now, but it's the early, early, early bird rate. That rate is until July 1st. So now is the best time for you to sign up. When you go to register, there's three different ways that you can res register for the symposium. There's the general admission, which gets you into all the different lectures that you want to go to. The caveat is there's three or four lectures going on at the same time. So the second option allows you to purchase the videos of all the lectures for you to be able to watch at a later time. So that allows you and gives you access to everybody that's presenting if there's two people presenting at the same time that you would really like to see. The format that those are in is it's a streaming service. So it's, it's, if you've ever purchased a training course from anybody before, it's very similar to that. So you log in and then there's all the presentations that are there. You just click, you watch, you stream. It's how it works. The third option is the VIP option. And included in that is the Sunday after the symposium, a limited number of people will be coming out to our gym, the S5 compound at Elite FTS with a handful, maybe a little bit more of the presenters that are there just to train, to hang out, have some barbecue, have a good time. And that again is limited on the attendance. It's already 50% sold out or 50% of the spots left, depending on how you wanna look at it. Go to the link in the description. We'll have more information about the Swiss throughout the podcast as we move forward. We have a lot of the presenters booked for the podcast, so we'll be talking more about it. We'll see you there. Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate, and we are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. <laughs> What's going on guys? We're back with another episode of Table Talk. My guest today is Pete Rubish. He's back again. We had him out four months ago, right before we started the podcast. We were talking about bouncing, so I want to finish the story I was telling beforehand, where I asked him if you ever did any bar backing, which is you got to carry the kegs, because you were, you were in a college bar, and it's super, super packed. I was in BG, Bowling Green at the time. The best thing about being a bar back 
you could plow through the fucking crowd, right? Because you got the keg, it's like, whoa, and people are fucking getting knocked over left and right. <laughs> it, was, it was the revenge for all the bullshit you had to go through, you know, before that. So you missed out on that opportunity. Yeah. Plus in the back, and it was, Mike Israel made a post a couple weeks ago, and it was, he was doing a tricep extension. I, you know, you got the bar and the bench, and you're, it's like a body weight tricep extension, right? I've always called them keg presses, because I used to do them when I bounced. And I'd go to the back, and you'd grab the keg, and it'd be like almost like a JM press, just to get the tricep pump, so when you go back out on the floor, your arms look a little bit fucking bigger. And then, and then you had the kegs that were rounded, you know, so that was more like a, more like a fat grip bar than the skinny ones. And um, so I made a post on his thing saying these are called keg presses. He had some other name for it. I can't remember, like inverted body weight extensions or some bullshit where, so there's, there's that. So we'll get off of the bouncer stories and get onto the podcast. So had you out before three and a half hours went by like that and then afterwards it's there are a lot of things that i thought about we didn't talk there's a lot of things that we didn't cover that i wanted to throw in there and um, other things that people asked after you left to be able to throw in there so just to kind of get people up to speed you're 30 pounds lighter now than you were then so what what's going on what, what have you been doing yeah, so last time I came here, it was around February 20th, I want to say, or February 13th, and I was about 238 pounds, whereas now I'm about 207, 208 pounds, so I've lost 30 pounds in the last few months, and I've kind of gotten into running, and I'm still lifting. Like, the big misconception is, okay, you're not lifting heavy, and I mean, it was just Friday where I tried a 650 deadlift, um, got it to my knees, almost locked it out, but couldn't quite lock it out. And so the strength is still there, you know, I'm still benching like 330 pounds, um, but it's obviously down a bit. It's not mm -hmm. what it was. Back then I was deadlifting 700 pounds, benching 390. So it's taken a hit. Uh, the thing with running, I never liked running. I always hated it. I thought it was stupid. I, I, I hated cardio in general. Um, but I think I'm at a point now where it's like the challenge of it, I, it's so tough for me that it's like a place I can go to kind of face my demons. And it's like, I need a new challenge. My body's kind of broken down from lifting. My back still hurts a lot from time to time, my hip, whatever. Um, I can't lift what I used to, you know, I just can't. And I'm still trying to maintain as much as I can. But it's like, I used to go in my basement and face those demons with heavy weight. And now it's like I do that out there in the heat of the day running. It's like I'm facing my demons. So I need this to like escape and almost get in my head and have this time. And it's just a new challenge. So that's kind of where this has come from. That's what's led to the weight loss. Nobody likes to run above, you know, 200 pounds. It sucks. There, you don't want to run. Your yeah, joints and yeah, stuff yeah, don't yeah. want you to be running at 230 pounds. You're, the shin splints I've had for like four months, they're finally starting to go away. Um, so it's just not practical at that weight. But it's kind of cool because running also ties into health. So it's like I'm knocking out two birds with one stone where I have this new challenge. Um, and I want to do some crazy stuff coming up. And then I also have the health, where my health is constantly improving. I'm more I'm more interested in the demon thing because I get that. Like when you're lifting heavy, you know, it's, you, yes, you're battling that, but you're not really doing it with 135, two and a quarter. I mean, it's the top sets where you go to that place. And how's that, how's that work when you're running? Because we're talking about battling demons. That's like one big fucking punch in the face. To to battling demons, it's just like talking to them for an hour. You, you, I don't know how to ask what I'm trying to ask here, but I think you get what I'm saying. I know exactly what you're saying because I've been on both sides. So it's hard to explain because I, I get where you're coming from, where in the basement it was, you know, in the basement you got to understand, much of the time I was alone with just the music, and I would get into a zen state of just like, I could get out all the emotions, all the things that had been building up, the frustrations, the the anger, everything. It would all come to a head in the basement where I could let that out and just have time in my own head. Like I didn't have a lot of training partners. Dan would come over and deadlift once a week. Um, Dan Paschok of Madtown Fitness. But other than that, it was by myself. And it was a place where I could go through my entire life and literally break it down for those couple of hours and then channel that energy into the weights. Whereas now 
when I'm out on the trail or whatever, I'm outside, I'm often doing it at the peak heat of day. It'll be like 1 p.m. It's hot as heck. Like, it's not like I'm going out there like, this is going to be fun. It's like, I know this is going to be tough. It's going to suck. I'm going to be, you know, breathing heavy. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a challenge. And I've always needed a challenge in my life. So it's almost good because in the last couple of years, I felt like I didn't have like a good outlet, a good challenge. And this is something like that's really hard for me where it's new. And I just process all these thoughts, all these emotions of just like what's going on in my life. I can break them down. And I, I, I go to places in my head that there's so many distractions on a daily basis now in our lives. I can't get to. But when I'm out there, it's just me. There's no music. I don't do that. It's just me in my head to like go with, work through everything. Like find out who I am where I literally go through every little dissect, every little thing. And I'm like, this is what you're doing. This is where you're going. This is what you're doing wrong. This is what you're doing right in your life. This is what you need to change. And uh, you get this real like therapeutic connection of just breaking down your life one by one, brick by brick. And it's just, that's, that's what it's all about basically. So it's more about the processing than the aggression. Yes. So the aggression, the, that, that you haven't replaced with the running, unless you're doing like no. hill sprints or some shit. No, there's the aggression. Um, like I still lift heavy. The aggression yeah, yeah. comes from the weights. When I pulled the 650 the other day, I got very aggressive. And that's part of the thing with the testosterone levels rebounding back higher now. I can feel it. Like I can get into that state where for two years I couldn't, where I was like, two years I would try to pull a heavy deadlift and I just was like chill. Now I'm like, I can get it back. Even being off PEDs, I get like crazy, like this dark mindset. Like I'm gonna freaking kill this weight. I get like genuinely pissed off, like I'm gonna smash this. And it's like super intense. And uh, I still get that with the lifting, especially deadlift primarily. But this is more of like um, the other side of the coin where I can just work through my battles and my struggles and get in my head and I have that time. So that's why I don't do music, don't, you know. I get it now, so it's like the in between the sets and like the accessory stuff of when you're in the basement is what you're yes. able to replace with that. But the aggression part, you still have through the weights. Exactly. All right, now with your with your testosterone, it was coming back up slowly. Is it con up more since the last time you were here and where's it at now? So I think last time I was here, it was about 350. And then in April, late April, I got it checked, 500. So it's come up a lot. I think now it's even higher. I, I feel it. Like I feel way more aggressive um, in the sense of like, I'm gonna go get my goals. I'm gonna accomplish them. I feel more driven. I feel I can lift a lot heavier. I can maintain my strength a lot better, even with less training. I feel just way different. The, the drive and mental state is entirely different. So just, cause you gotta think like, you could say 500 nanograms per deciliter. That's not that high. Um, especially when I was used to being at, you know, 2000 baseline. Yeah. But when you go from 360 or 350 to 500, it's like basically taking it up, you know, 33%. It's a massive difference. Like you feel that you feel way different. And now it could be 556. I think everybody has a tipping point too. So say your tipping point is like 425 or something like that. And once you get over there, you feel normal again, where if it's under that, it's, it's less. Do you, was there anything that you did more than what you were doing before we spoke last time to bring that up? Or do you think it's just more a function of time doing the things that you were doing before? People are going to think I'm crazy. This is my theory. Yeah. This is my theory. I'm all about theories. Okay. <laughs> the one major change, listen to this. So I don't even think it's time because I was off for over two years and it still was like 350. Mm -hmm. I got a under the sink reverse osmosis water filter. I was drinking tap water my whole life, drink tap water. And you can look online, there's, I forget the website where it shows all the contaminants in your local water source. Every mm -hmm. single city has them. They're just different depending on where you live. And I've been drinking tap water my whole life. I would just refill a jug every day with tap water. And then I got that filter on started drinking it for like two months and the test levels shot way up. All my hormones improved, my thyroid function. So I think there was a lot of hormone disruptors in the water system, um, a lot of chemicals and stuff in the tap water that I was drinking. I think that was suppressing all my hormones. And That's my no, other, no other changes though? Not really, that's the one I can think of. You could potentially say maybe 
cardiovascular exercise had something to do with it, like losing body fat, leaning down. That could be another. Maybe. Those are the only two theories. Yeah, yeah. Nothing else changed. So it's either partially, I think, the hormone disruptors in the water system go into that as well as maybe leaning down, having less body fat to where your body's more functioning more effectively. Those are the two changes. And it was in April that you had it done last. Right? Yeah. So I also weighed then like probably at least 10 pounds heavier than now. When are you going to get pulled again? Probably a week or two. I'm going to get Merrick's okay. going to write on another panel. So, okay. I'm really interested to see where it will go now. I'm you feeling know. even better than back then. So I think it's close to upper five, six, mm -hmm. which would be back to a good optimal range. You know, so I, I'm very happy with it. What about the other blood markers that you track? Insanely good. Like it was shocking. This is where I was like, okay, cardio, there's something to this. Um, Cause my whole life I'd been very off put by cardio. I didn't want to do that because cardio and losing weight and all that, it makes you weaker. Why mm -hmm. would I want that when I'm trying to be as strong as possible? I want, I wanted higher blood pressure, you know, and <laughs> like, that's what makes you strong. So I never did it. I, I, I hated it, but I saw the, the changes on this panel and it was insane. I mean, I had the lowest fasting insulin level I've like ever seen. It was 2.3, which is like your insulin sensitivity is stupid at that point. You can't get any lower. It couldn't possibly. Um, A1C was down to like 4.9 from 5.2. Um, glucose was 80 fasted. Like insulin sensitivity was crazy. Um, my APOB, apolipoprotein B was 80-ish. I think it was 80, which now I was, you know, I was talking earlier um, with Sheena and like, LDL and HDL, they say, is kind of obsolete. They say that does not accurately predict your heart disease risk and all that. It's apolipoprotein B. That's what you got to get checked. That's the most important cardiovascular metric biomarker for your, your chance of heart disease and heart attack. And that was really good. Um, and I'm trying to think, C-reactive protein barely registered at all. It was like 0.2. Uh, there's like no inflammation at all, no systemic inflammation. Um, now LDL, even if it's not what it once was thought to be, that went down like 30 points to 105, and I'm genetically it's higher for me. Everything improved. So like, there was nothing negatively that was impacted with the cardio when it was introduced. No, you could say maybe cardiovascular exercise can lower hematocrit a little bit and that sort of thing. Um, I don't remember the exact mechanism for that. Uh, so I have started supplementing like iron. My hematocrit was like 39 and a half, which is trash. I'd want it to be higher to get the max benefits of like maximizing your oxygen utilization. Mm -hmm. But uh, I started supplementing with iron bisglycinate because it's a more absorbable form. And then um, a good source of vitamin C, kamu kamu, to help absorb the iron further. But that was the only thing that potentially maybe took a little bit of a hit. And also those levels can read light, they can read lower when you're super hydrated going into uh, a panel. So like if you're really hydrated, you have like a liter before you go in, which you're supposed to, your kidney functions will be better, but also your hematocrit and hemoglobin might actually be lower. Mm -hmm. So it can kind of throw, it can kind of skew that a little bit. How did you introduce the cardio into your training? Because knowing you, there's one of two ways that happen here, and it's probably the one you just fucking just started doing it at that two miles a day or some shit instead of gradually building up into it. So how did you, what did you do? All in like zero to 100. I mean, it well, was, what is the 100? Cause the 100 isn't what you're doing now. No, it was, yeah, it was, yeah. um, so it's been four months now, yeah, right? Yeah. I've been doing it. And I started out like a mile and I was gassing. I was dying on the treadmill, like dying, just, you know, huffing for air. It was so slow. I felt terrible. And uh, I just kind of built it up slowly with treadmill runs for like two, hundred, two to two and a half months was like all on the treadmill. Were you able to run the whole time when you started? The, if I went slow enough. <laughs> That's the key. People think, oh, I can't. They're like, I got to stop. To, I'm like, mm -hmm. if you slow down and run slower, you'll be able to run. And then you, slide, you gradually build up the, the speed. But um, so I would do treadmill runs inside because I couldn't really leave the gym. And I would do them at like 530 in the morning. And I would just do two, three miles and I would play around with the incline and all that. And then I got to where I started going outside and I was doing hills and all sorts of crazy stuff. And like now I'm like really serious. Like I got a coach. 
I've made more progress in three weeks off my speed than I did in three months having a coach because I'm actually like doing, you know, different workouts that are specific, similar to like conjugate. It's like yeah. there's a speed day, there's a, a long day. So it's very similar as far as that. So I've made drastic improvements with a coach. It's, it's been huge. But it's just now I'm up to like 43 miles a week, you know, mm -hmm. whereas back then maybe it was 15. And where do you want to take it? <laughs> That's the, I mean, I kind of know, I don't want to let like too much, yeah. you know, but no, I get out it. of the bag, but like, I it. I'm not going to half marathon secret city, the local one in November. And I want to be really fast. Like mm -hmm. the goal right now is speed. I'm trying to build speed. All right. <clears throat> so I'm trying to do it in an hour, 40 minutes, which is, um, under an hour, 40 minutes. It's like a seven thirty seven pace. So for me, that's pretty freaking fast. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and I've done a few half marathons already that were, you know, just in training that were slower. And then next year, April, I want to do the Knoxville Marathon in like 315. So those are kind of the main goals. Those are speed goals. Like you have to really build your speed up with intervals and that kind of stuff. And then eventually ultras, like for real. Mm -hmm. So it's all going that way. So if the strength is the goal to maintain where your strength level is and not let it fall, because growing it and with, with what it is, you probably don't need to be stronger, but you don't want to be weaker either. Yeah, I don't want to be weak at all. I want, yeah. to be, I want to be the strongest guy out there, the biggest guy, like as far as muscle mass. Um, because you're not going to see guys doing this above 200 pounds too much. Mm -hmm. But I want to I want to still deadlift minimum like 650, ideally seven. I'm like right there now at 650. And then bench, the absolute minimum acceptable where I, I wouldn't hate myself would be 315. <laughs> but I want to get that closer to 350. Yeah. And then squat, I don't really do. I just do split squats heavy mm -hmm. for legs. So how has your how has the weight training changed since you've started doing this? I mean, how, how do you program it per se? Because obviously you're not block training this to be able to peak the deadlift. Weight training is secondary to the running because I have the base with the weight training to where it's natural. I've got you know 17 years of experience. It comes like that. The strength. So I'm kind of that's like secondary. The running's the focus because that's what I suck at. That's what I need to work on. And I'll just kind of, one day I'll like deadlift 45 minutes, do my deadlifts once a week, the heavy deads. And then another day, I'll have three days of bench. I'm still benching three days a week where I'll just like bench is it. I'll go and I'll do my three days of bench. I'm done. I make it quick, get in, get out. And then I'll have days of accessory where it's like back raises, pull-ups and uh, split squats. And that's pretty, so like five days, but they're very short, quick, 45 minutes, get it done. And, and get and go on your way. Then how do you lay that out? We the reason I'm asking this is because there's <clears throat> there's a lot of people out there that are trying to do what you're doing in different types of ways. Maybe not to that same extreme, but they want to push both. And sometimes I think they focus too much on the strength training part and not enough on like the road work periodization of the actual conditioning stuff. And um, to the point that it's almost insanity. You know, like they're worried about everything through there where so as that base progresses over time, if you're getting thinking forward, if you're getting closer to a race, are your repetitions in the gym going to go higher? Potentially, I mean, I think you have to you have to lean into what you suck at. Like I've, I've always lifted the heavy weights, so I suck at the running. I'm slow. So I'm leaning into that to get faster, create the speed, but that means lifting secondary. Now, if you were like a running background, you'd lean into the lifting more. Yeah. Because you've already, it's just do what you suck at, get better at that. And then the other one is the secondary focus. Um, but I would say the key is to making it manageable and not have like a ridiculous schedule to where you can still get other stuff done. Is just being efficient with your sessions where you you can do five days a week of lifting, but it's gotta be quick. Get in, get out, not long rest times not a ton of warming up prioritize certain exercises like for me that's bench and deadlift and then split squats it's like those are the priorities i'm going to knock them out so you have to cut back on the number of exercises but pick the few that you are going to maintain your physique with maintain your strength and want to build on maybe five exercises that's all you're going to do and you're just going to lean into those and then maybe do like one a day or two so it's like i've picked out bench deadlift split squats back extensions and then uh pull-ups that's it it's like those are what i do i don't do anything else got it and i just hammer them and i try to i still try to get them stronger but it's it's got to be quick
No, I guess so. You're basing it all on that strength aspect, and and instead of trying to figure out which movements are going to have the better correspondence to your running. Yeah, I don't care about that. And, okay, that's that's where I was okay. getting at. So they're completely Set. two worlds that you're not going to let the strength world fuck up the other world. No, it's it's. I don't lift for my running benefits. Screw that. Like I want to be strong. Mm -hmm. Like that doesn't change. I don't care being off PEDs. I don't care about being lighter. You still want to be strong. That never yeah. goes away. We talked about that's the intensity outlet. That's where the aggression comes out. I need it. So I'm still lifting heavy, like as heavy for me at the time now. You know, bench isn't that impressive, but it's like 330. You know, for me, it's still heavy. Um, but I need that. And well, I don't, have I don't you found that. out, though, it's not really the number. It's how hard you have to push against it. Yeah. It's like the straining part that you crave. Not the actual 350, but being able to push on some fucker that doesn't want to move, but you have to keep pushing. Oh, exactly. And I think, too, that, I mean, that's the intensity part. Yeah. Like, if I'm lifting lightweight, I don't have to get jacked up, but yeah. I put 650 on the bar now. It's like, I got to get in a state, and I love that state because that's the basement state. So it's still there. It's a different context, but it's still there. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, who doesn't want to be, I think, especially in our line, if, if I'm going to do this, why wouldn't I want to be the most muscular, lean, strongest guy out there? I don't want to be a weak, small runner. Like, like I want to be impressive. I want to be the strongest. I want to still have strength. I want to have it all. Like uh, like Nick Bear or something. Like He's mm -hmm. very impressive physique. Like That's what I want. I don't want to be just this small, weak guy. Like No. So it, it, the lifting has to be there. I need it. But it's all based around strength. There's nothing I'm thinking about in terms of physique or in terms of enhancing my running. Mm -hmm. It's just like I'm still going to try to be as strong as possible because that's the core of who I am. That's the passion. Well, I think that that's the part that never goes away, too. No. You know, so it's, as, as we spoke before, we've been around meatheads our entire life, and there's a certain thing that happens, you know, if you're like five feet away from the lift that you're getting ready to do. You know, it's like you're on this fucking stage that you crave, you know, to be on. And you think about it all the time, even when you're not there. But then when you're there, everything else kind of goes away. And it's just that. And it's you can't replicate that. Yeah. But you but the what took me a long time to realize the bar weight doesn't matter. It's the strain that it's you thinking you might not be able to do it for that split second that makes you think, what the fuck did I just say to myself? That, right? That thing. And then the, that, that, those five yards, man, they're beautiful. You know, then that goes away. I don't know where you replace. That's why I was asking with the running earlier, like, how do you replace that? You know, you don't know. You just keep it in. It gives me goosebumps to think about because I, I, it's even like, um, and this is what I didn't have for like two years when I came off PEDs. This element of it was gone. That's what screwed with me because I couldn't get that aggression. I couldn't get that feeling. Like my my levels were so jacked up and low where I was like, I can't get this feeling. Now it's back. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I've missed this. But it's like you can put on that trigger song, that one song where you're just like, I know I'm going to freaking lose my mind when this comes on because it's like that pretext, that mm -hmm. buildup where I flip that song on. And I'm about to hit that heavy deadlift, and it just puts me in the state where I get this crazy aggressive feeling, and just literally that attacking the bar, like I love it. I just, I still get that, and it's, it's like that's what it's all about. So you never replace that, heck no. It's a different thing. It's, it's a, it's a, it's like a torture fest of running's like a torture fest of like I'm gonna dig through my emotions, and I'm gonna dig through my problems, and I'm gonna dig through my mind, and I'm gonna dissect them. Lifting's like this aggressive outlet of like that primal need to to uh, get the intensity and aggression out. Yeah, that's the that's the difference. They're just different. No, I get it. I guess it's like a, it. It would be like the accessory training in gym by yourself. You know, like training partners disrupt that. But if you're just in there training by yourself and you got to do fucking lap pull downs and all this other kind of bullshit, you know, the stuff you really don't care to do, but you just do it. You know, it's it's that piece. I guess is what you're looking at. Um, Non-disruptive bullshit to be able to just, I get it. No, I get it. That's why you can't, yeah, it's, it's. Uh, I mean, that's the part I like about it where I'm like, it's therapeutic in that sense. It sucks the whole time you're doing it. Like, you're like, man, this is hard. I'm, you know, that that is true, but it's the thera therapy aspect of it where I can go into my mind 
and figure out life. Work through it. That's what I like. And it's a challenge. It's hard as heck for me. Like lifting almost comes easy because I've done it so long. But running is a challenge that is very, a very big undertaking for me. So I'm, a kind of, I'm the kind of person I always need this challenge in my life where I feel lost and empty. If I don't have some kind of challenge, I could be climbing, trying to climb Mount Everest. You know, I need something big. Otherwise, I don't feel alive. I don't feel right. I, I, and I'm not doing reckless things per se, but I need something that's a very big undertaking that I'm working towards or I don't feel right. Like I can't just go through the motions of life. No, I can. I think that's what a lot of people miss is they, <clears throat> the shiny thing you work toward, right? So it, say it was a 900 pound deadlift at some point in time, you know you're not getting that in eight weeks. It's gonna take time, you know? So what you were talking about you wanna do, you know that's gonna take time. And that's like 12 fucking months away, which means now you gotta think. How's this next month going to lay into this month and then this month? And I shouldn't do this shit now because it will definitely fuck up that next month, which means I'm not going to be able to do this in 12 months. It, that processing of being able to how to lay that objective out to work toward and not have it be fucking easy. Because right then if it's easy, you're not, it doesn't scare you and it doesn't motivate you to be able to move towards it. It's gotta be like a stretch, I don't like the word goal because I think it's limiting, objective, like a stretch objective. That's like, okay, fuck, you know, I don't wanna do this today, but if I don't, it's, I know this won't happen. Exactly. Right, and then, and, and vice versa, like, man, I, I wanna keep fucking going right now, but if I do, it's gonna fuck the training up, so that may not happen. And um, you take that away, I think you lose some passion and drive for everything, right? Because some people don't have anything that they drive towards. Some people have too many things that they're trying to drive towards. But yeah, I think if you have one good one, everything else kind of falls into place. Like work falls into place a little bit better. Everything else kind of falls into place. And as a, as a, as a meathead, a former meathead, it really fell into place because they're like, okay, this four, this three months, I'm going to be a dickhead. So I probably need to not focus on work that much because I'm not going to sell very much because I'm going to be a dickhead. <laughs> you know, so I got to put that here. You know, so you had to prioritize. It's an extreme example, <laughs> but I think you get where I'm coming from. I mean, like a major objective, you're spot on. It dials you in in every other way. If you are passionless going through life and you're just going through the motions and every day is the same and you're not working towards anything, striving, dude, that's not going to bring out the best in you. Your life's going to be crappy. But when you're working towards a major pursuit, everything else becomes honed in razor sharp. It's like it dials you in. You, you get more out of everything else. So I think everybody needs that. I don't care what it is. It could be the weights and that's what a lot of people are going to relate to. That's what we relate to. 900 pound deadlift. It could be a crazy bench. It could, but it, you got to have something. Every, everybody at some point needs a major undertaking that they're after. Otherwise, life just becomes dull and meaningless and passionless and everything suffers because of it. I think a secondary thing that happens because of that is whatever that is that you're pushing for takes time. <laughs> Hours per day or whatever it's going to be. And then when that takes a fairly decent chunk of time, the rest of your day has to be managed better. So now you have less idle time, right? So the more idle time that, I, that I've found, the more idle time people have, or even the more idle time that I have, you know, if, if they finish a project early, the, the worse my life gets. Because you're sitting around fucking scrolling through shit, and then it's like, what the fuck? And now you're depressed, now you're upset, now you're mad all the time. Like, why am I mad all the time? Well, because I'm not fucking doing anything. So that you see, so when, when you have those things and it's like, okay, fuck, I got to run today. I got to train today. I got to get this done today. You know, then you got like three hours left at the very end. If you get everything done, you're not fucking off. Idle time is destructive. That's the thing. You're hundred percent right. Like I don't have idle time to screw around as much. When I have all these other things going on, I've got the gym, I've got to train clients, I've got to answer all these emails, I've got to put up a video for the day, I've got to go run for an hour, I've got to lift for an hour. 
I have to spend time with my daughter. I have to find time in there. So like when I put her down for a nap, that's when I head out the door. That means I'm running in the peak heat a day. It sucks. <laughs> but it's like that's when I have to do it. That's when I have to get it done. And I'm, I'm okay with that. But it dials you in. You have to have everything like on this tight schedule. Lifting, you don't you don't mess around. You're just kind of uh, quicker, you know, rest times in between, all that sort of stuff. So I agree that idle time is where people get into trouble. That's where they fall into bad habits, whether it's like, you know, it could be drugs, drinking, whatever. It could be, you know, watching porn all day, that kind of stuff. That's when it happens, when they have too much idle time. So you're going to be more productive. Your life is going to be better when you're, when you're dialed in. Yeah, okay, so with, with those that I've seen, with that, it spreads. Idle time spreads fast, like the fucking flu. It spreads like a virus. Productive time opens very slow. It's very hard to add more productive time. So that's what people have to watch with the idle time is that they get a little bit, it's like, thank God, I got a couple hours of free time. It's good, but be careful, right? Because it's very easy for that the next time around to become three, four. It spreads, boom, like that. Where when you're, that, what's the staying go? If you want to get something done, ask somebody who's busy as fuck and they'll get it done because they don't have time to fuck around. It's like, okay, yeah, I said I'm going to do this. Give it to me. Give it to me. <laughs> Let me fucking do this right now. <laughs> Let me get this done so I can go about my other stuff. Or somebody with too much fucking idle time is like, oh, yeah, I'll just get to that later. But idle time, too, that's what makes people depressed. Mm -hmm. It's like you said, you're scrolling through everything. You have all this time to, and it's not like uh, productive thinking. Like if I'm running, I feel like it's productive thoughts. It's like a productive dissection of my life. But when it's idle time, it's an unproductive dissecting of your time. Like I'm getting deja vu thinking about this because it's, it's just one of those things where it's like there's productive thought processes and unproductive. And in idle time, you're just messing around. It's you're, you're passive. Your brain is almost shut off to where you're like, oh, this guy's got it better than me or something like like that. It's not this deep. It's a great point, man. You have it. It's really hard to have depressing and negative thoughts while you're active. You know, so while you're running, while you're doing cardio, while you're training, while you're moving, it's really hard to be depressed. You know, when you're not moving, you know, it's a lot easier. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with that. It's it's um, it's different. So I, I try to, you know, you want to eliminate a lot of that. And, you know, I mean, I kind of want to segue into something real quick. Yeah, because this is uh, it's pretty recent, obviously. So. You know, I posted about it, obviously. My um, my dog, I had to put her down on Monday. And I, I kind of want to get into it just because of the life lessons. I feel like I've already learned from that experience. Um, and it kind of ties into this to where I, we adopted her when she was two years old from the shelter, uh, pit mix. She was the saddest dog at the shelter, basically. So my wife was, of course, like, you got to get that one. And I lived alone at the time we were dating. And the dog was for me. She's like, you got to get that one. It's the saddest one. Needs the most love. And there were like 10 dogs at the shelter. Two thirds of them were pit mixes. And she was one of them. So I got her. I've had her for six and a half years. You know, she, uh, she was eight and a half. And um, basically, uh, you know, Friday, took, she hadn't been eating as much. And I kind of attributed it to the warmer weather. I was like, okay, it's warming up outside. That's pretty normal for appetite to decrease. She was starting to get thin. I took her into the vet. They did blood work, whatever, on Friday. Wasn't going to get back till Monday. Um, and she was still really energetic. There were no other sides. She was great, acting like herself, playing, wagging her tail, drinking all the water. But she just wasn't eating as much. And then Saturday, like, you know, I got home, pulled into the driveway, and she didn't, like, look around the corner like she normally does, barking on the balcony. And I thought, that's really weird. That's not good. And I went out there, piece of ham held in front of her, wouldn't touch it turned her head then I knew I'm like something's way off so I knew I couldn't wait till Monday for the blood work I was like I gotta figure out what's going on right now and this is about 8 30 at night Saturday night everything's closed I'm like we're gonna drive to Knoxville go to the animal hospital and uh you know we went to the animal hospital I, I you know I was like opened a, a animal vet credit line like I just didn't even care I'm like I'll spend whatever let's get this done let's get this figured out 
and uh, they did x-rays. I was thinking maybe there's a ball in her stomach kind of lodged in, we'll get surgery, open it up, even if it's four grand, whatever, I'll mm -hmm. do it. They're, they come back, they're like, okay, she's got a very enlarged heart. So like, she's got a very significant heart murmur too. Um, could be heartworms, but I knew it wasn't that. She, they had already tested her for that. It wasn't that at the vet, but they did it again, you know, to see. And uh, they, nothing, you know, so they did blood work. And the blood work they got back right away because it's like an ER for animals. And uh, as soon as the lady walked in, she didn't have to say anything. I knew. Like, she, I, I knew. And I just said, let's see it. Like, hand me it. Because I know how to interpret blood work pretty mm -hmm. well. And actually, dog blood work is almost the exact same as humans. Really strange, right? It's almost the exact same. Um, it's the same stuff. Like, the, 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 the reference ranges are the same. So... She didn't even have to tell me. I was looking at it, and I just freaking, my heart sank. Dude. It just dropped into my stomach because I knew looking at it, that was it. Um, kidney failure complete, like end stage, done. Like, you're done. That's why she deteriorated so fast from mm -hmm. Friday to Saturday. Um, and to put this into perspective, like, a normal human creatinine, you know, will be like maybe 1.2. Hers was 12 her uh, BUN, BUN, it might get 20, 25. Hers was 150. Like complete kidneys are shot. Um, normal hematocrit for us, 45, you know. Hers was like 23. Platelets were like zero. Everything was shutting down. Uh, and they, you know, I just knew. I like burst into tears. I was like, this is it. It's, it's over, you know. I knew it. And I, I came in that day, or going to the, to the animal hospital, I'm like thinking like, We'll be able to fix it, whatever. Um, I wasn't expecting that, that at all as far as her, like, being on her deathbed. So they asked me, like, do you want to put her down now or whatever? And I'm like, no, I'm not ready. I wasn't even planning for this. I'm going to take her home. Took her home for two nights, slept on the floor right next to her, you know, like, didn't leave her side. She was, all she would do was sleep. Wasn't really eating or drinking at that point. Um, just completely, you know. And she didn't seem like she was suffering, but... She just wasn't, it, well, you knew it was over. Uh, but I just needed that time to have that closure and have her people around and all that. Um, and I, I knew Monday I had I'd, to I'd, I'd do it, you know, I'd take her in and, and put her down. And that was like one of the hardest things in my life. Um, Cause it's like one of your best friends, you know? We still have another dog, but she was like my dog from the beginning, uh, put all that time into her. But, you know, her death made me realize like we can't take stuff for granted. We take everything for granted because we're living this passive existence a lot of times. We get sucked into this idle time. We get sucked into this passive lifestyle where we're, we're, we're looking at sports, we're looking at social media, we're watching TV, whatever it may be. And it doesn't mean, you know, I don't like to cuss a lot, but it doesn't mean shit. It's like, what does that mean? That you don't, I don't look back when she's on her deathbed and say, dang, I, I'm sad I missed that game a year ago. I don't give a crap. I don't, I don't even know what happened with, with the sports last year. I don't know who won. I don't remember. You don't remember. I don't remember social media. I don't remember the praise I've gotten. It's like none of that. It's all obsolete. It doesn't mean anything. And at that moment, you would just give anything to have, that, have her back or to, to be able to fix it. You'd pay, you'd hand them a blank check and you'd say, I don't care if this, this puts me massively in debt or I can't, you know, do it, do whatever you got to do, save her, but you can't, it's over. So you go from thinking here, I'm thinking she's eight, eight and a half years old. I'm like, okay, she'll live to be 12, 15. I got five more years at least. That's what I kept thinking. That's what I've always thought. I'm like, I got plenty of time. She's, she's still relatively young till she has 48 hours to live. That's it. It's a wrap. You go from that to that, that shift. And it just makes you realize you're like, you cannot take People, animals, whatever, for granted. You can't take this time for granted because it could all be snatched away in that second, just like that. And I thought about it, and I'm like, I just took her for granted. Like, she had a great life. We saved her. She would have been put down, um, and she had a great life, and I took good care of her. But I, I can't say, like, I did take her for granted. And that's, like, the most painful thing to where it's like, you're thinking, I got five more years. There's no rush. I can spend time with her tomorrow or a year from now. I can do more of that. But then you, you look, and you're like, that's it. And I wish I'd spent a little more time. I wish I'd, I'd take her on more walks. I wish I'd thrown the ball with her more. And it's like that just, and you can relate that to your, your relationships with your wife or with your, your kid. And you're like, it's not going to be there forever. You don't know what's happening tomorrow. 
but you were spending time looking at the damn football game or like looking at how that's going or looking through your feed you, and you don't care at all about that like you could have taken that time and, and better utilize it on the people around you and it was just like psh, just it's one of those things where it just made me like want to dial in that much more where i'm like what am i freaking doing this stuff doesn't matter at all like who freaking cares in that moment all you care about are like you're you, the regrets you're gonna have on your deathbed are gonna be I didn't spend enough time with him. I didn't spend enough time with her. And it's like a dog is almost to me. It's like a person. It's like a human. It's like, it's like family. So I think of it in the same level. It's the same amount of grieving. You know, I hadn't cried in at least a year or two, at least. I, I you know, I don't do that. And I was bawling the last couple of days. It's just like, it tore me up. And, uh, it's one of those hard lessons where it's like, take people for granted at your own risk because it's going to come back to bite you. It's tough. I mean, losing, putting a dog down is tough. It's, it's like losing a person. I mean, it is, it's tough. And it's, it's a wake up call, you know, that is strong in the moment. Like for you right now, it's really strong. The, um, the trick or the challenge of that is to carry it forward, you know, so it's remembered two months from now, four months from now a year from now, right? Because the further you get away from it, the more people can slip back into, I don't want to say old habits, you know, but it's, I've had, I've lost a lot of people, right? So it's, I don't want to sit here and, and say, because it sounds shitty that, you know, the more people and the more things that you lose, the more you become aware of how important it is, you know, and, but it's, it's true, but a lot of people like yourself are trying to give that message to a lot of people that may have suffered one loss or no loss. And I don't want to say it falls on deaf ears because anybody that hearing that story felt it, you know, so it's not falling on deaf ears because they, they feel that story. The trick though is to always remember it because as soon as you begin to forget it, it happens again. Then, then after a while, you're like, you know what? I don't need reminded of this shit anymore. But you're still gonna be, because it's gonna, you know, happen again. <clears throat> so you. That, that's what I've seen. You know, I hadn't dealt with a lot of loss in the last few years. My grandparents passed away about eight years ago. So for the last eight years, there was not, you know, there were lifters around me, which always got to me like obviously when you see a fellow lifter who you've come up with pass especially at a young age it hits home and that what that did for me i did channel those every one of them every time there's a death in the industry i channel it because i say this is why i need to take care of my health this is why i'm doing the cardio this is why i'm doing this stuff to change my lifestyle that i do take it i don't let any of them go for for nothing like i, I and it's not just for my you know for that sake but i try to take those messages and like really internalize it and use it for good um, because I feel like we should be more aware of our health and stuff. So, but I, I hadn't had to directly deal with loss. My grandparents eight years ago, that was it. So this was like the first time. And it was that reminder that you said, like I couldn't have necessarily felt that without, without directly feeling it. I wouldn't have known like if someone had told me that, but now it's like this thing where you like, you want to hang on to it. You want to hang on to it to use it to be better moving forward. That's the difference. Like, I want to not forget. I want to not take people for granted. I want to not waste my time on stuff that I'll look back on, not even think twice about. That's the take home message. Um, and I feel like being more aware of death is good. Like the more aware we are of our own demise, eventually that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. The better we live our life. When we think, don't think about death and we think everything's good and we're going to live forever and we don't confront it that's when we make mistakes. But when you're really dialed into like, that's a distinct possibility and it's gonna come for all of us and all, and people around us, our loved ones are gonna die, we dial in. Yeah, I think it's dialing, being aware and dialing in to be able to live the best quality life you can is the important factor, right? Because you can live to 90 and have the last 10 years just be for shit because your health is terrible and all that, you know, it's, I'd rather live to be 80, but have all my health be really good, 
so I can not have to, so I can enjoy the quality of life that's in there. And that's where we get into things like the blood markers and your health and all these other things. And, you know, obviously the younger you are, the more stupid we are. Not stupid, but the more risk we're going to take because it's just part of it. You know, I'm, I'll never look back and look at somebody in their 20s or 30s that did stupid shit like I do and, and say, don't do that. I'll never be that person because I did worse and I fucking loved it. I'm not going to sit here and lie. I loved it. I enjoyed it. But you can't get away with that shit as you get older and older, right? It's, it's shit even like a pulled muscle when you're over 50. It ain't like a pulled muscle when you're 30. It's still a pulled muscle, but one, ah, fuck it. You're training the next day, no big deal. The next one, you're like, man, fuck. And like two weeks later, you know, you do that when you're 70. Hell, you might pull a muscle and go in the hospital, have it looked at, and find out you got fucking kidney disease. Then die, right? So but keeping the, the health, the important health markers in check. And I think everybody is a little different. I mean, there's main ones, but everybody's going to have some variants on where that is. And the more you move down the path and get older, you stop making excuse. You stop making excuses for the reasons why things are fucked up. Right? It's easy to make the excuses when you're younger because you, you know what you can probably get away with. I'm not a doctor. You can probably get away with it. You know, but when you're fucking 45 and your blood pressure's through the roof, you can't say, no, this is awesome for fucking training. You know, it's like, no, probably not, you know, but you know the excuses, right? It's, they're, they're, they're we all used, I, we all used them when we're younger, but when you start, when, when I hear them from people that are in their 50s, it's like, dude, man, you know, did, did you seriously just say that? You know, it's like, well, yeah, dude, this is awesome. You know, I'm fucking bloated as fuck. I'm like, dude, you're fucking 57 years old. You know, you're bloated as fuck. You're purple. This is not good. You and know? That, and, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I did it too. I don't want to be a hypocrite and be like, guys, uh, don't take roids. Like, I freaking took everything. I did it, you know? <laughs> so who am I to be like, oh, that's bad. I don't, I don't try to demonize them. I try to say there's a time to, you know, I, I think I could have been more responsible and I might've gotten more out of them that way. But I don't want to demonize them and, and be like, I did it, but you guys can't. Like, um, but I do think there's a time to flip the switch and kind of be more about that, be more health conscious because I was the same way. I'm like, you know, blood pressure being up and all that kind of stuff, your cholesterol, all that, everything being out of whack. Like, you justify it. You did at the time. I did it. And um, now, you know, it's time to get serious more so because there's more to live for. And I'm not going to hit the weights, even if I wanted, if I took the same drugs as before. I probably wouldn't hit those weights because I have a lot more wear and tear in my body. It's just something's going to get pulled, like you said. Something's going to, my back's going to act up and, you know, stop the whole process. So it's, these things aren't, aren't as much of an option and that's part of it. But it's, uh, and that's another thing, like going back to the dog, Lucy, like with the kidney failure, it's, it's another thing. Take care of your kidneys. If there's nothing she could have done, it's not that, but your kidneys fail, it's game over. It's like, you can get lazy, you can get on uh, di dialysis for a while, but even so, you're not gonna live that long. You might have 10 years or whatever, um, kidney transplant and all that. So you gotta take care of these organs, they're very important. When the kidneys start shutting down, the heart shuts down. And it's, it, it's just, it's a wake up call. And the things people should really like worry about to take, take, you know, take care of on a blood panel, I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna get my insulin as low as possible. Insulin's an $11 test, guys. Nobody has an excuse not to check it. So you get your fasted insulin check, get as low as possible, because the lower it is, the more insulin sensitive. That's what you want. Your body's better at processing glucose. You're, you're in a good state. And then the other one I would check, apolipoprotein B, ApoB. That's gonna show cardiovascular health, heart health. That's way more accurate than LDL and HDL. Way better predictor. You can also, if you wanna kind of take it a step further, you can get into particle size with like an NM NMR profile to see the size of the LDL particles where in LDL, if it's uh, smaller, it's worse. Larger particles are actually better. Um, and you can kind of break that down, but just check insulin, ApoB, keep those as low as you can, and then C-reactive protein to kind of show a systemic full body inflammation. Those three metrics, if you get those checked and try to keep them down, I can almost guarantee you're gonna be in a, you know really, really good health, at like top tier health just by keeping those three things low. Those are like the three ones where you keep them down, you're gonna be in good shape. You know, there's a, 
there's a point I want to make with the blood work that <clears throat> it's interesting because I'm seeing it, you know, play out as we speak right here is, you know, I get blood work done quarterly and I get a full panel, then I get the, um, it's like a follow-up panel through Merrick. So there's the full panel, the follow -up. and I did all this even before Merrick. And when I think people hear others speak about blood work, you're into this, like you're way into it. You're into this deep. I mean, you're really into it. And there's other people that are really into it. And for some people, I think that intimidates them because they think, man, I don't want to have to low. I don't want to have to know all this shit. I'm on the other side of the coin. Like I'm, I'm not into all, I know the important things. I'm not into all that fucking shit. I just know I get it done. And Serrano was watching it for many years. He still does now. Now Merrick watches it. I just get it fucking done. Right, and then they'll tell me, look, this is fucked up. And then, okay, this is fucked up. Then I can have the conversation with them. I can reach out to you. I can reach out to different people that have had, hey, look, you had this fucked up, mine's fucked up, what'd you do? And reach out to the medical professionals to tell. But on both sides of the coin, you're still getting the stuff checked. You don't have to know everything you know, with that, especially in today's world where you have places like Merrick that it's, it's, you can't get any more simple than that. You know, like, here's this, here's that. And if they want it, if they're on a super, super tight budget, you just get to, you get two labs. Yeah. Like, my shit, my labs the other day, it's like the annual one. There's like 42 fucking, I mean, they drain an arm. You know, they yeah. got to go to the other one. It's like, oh, God. We almost made it, you know, because I was joking with them when they were pulling it. And then there's like, three more vials that they had to pull and there's like 30 of them or whatever, whatever. I'm like, man, I think we're going to make it. I think we're going to make it. And then it started, I'm like, fuck, you know, it was like one vial away and they had to go to the other arm. Almost. That's still a PR. I'll take a PR where I can take a PR, you know, almost all with the same one and then the other one. But I guess what I will say, if you're going to get labs done, it's always best to get them done. I think Merrick uses LabCorp. It's some place where the people pull labs all day, and that's all they do. Because if you go to like the random doctor's office where the nurse pulls like twice a week, nah, fuck that. Yeah. yeah. I haven't had a bad experience with anybody, but I've always basically gone to LabCorp request. Oh, I've had a bunch. You've had some bad ones? They miss. Oh you know, or it's just like, oh, five. Well, one time there was uh, seven, seven tries. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? You know, and it's finally. And that was just for a couple, a couple draws. That wasn't for like this whole pyramid, you know, cigar box full of vials, that, which is a normal one. Yeah, see, everybody's got a bad blood draw story except me, apparently. But I know what you mean. Like, when I get the full year panel done, it's like you get, like, 12, uh, 12 yeah. vials pulled. So, And then I'll, I'll kind of get, like, other ones just to kind of check up on things every couple months. Yeah, yeah. So it's just a maintenance yeah. type thing. You know, so, like, some things don't need to be checked no. every single year. Um well, obviously, the ones that are off that you're trying to dial in. Yep. You know, for me, the, my D, it's weird. My D goes all over the place, and I supplement the shit out of it. So sometimes I think, sometimes I'll use a brand to supplement that just sucks, mm -hmm. and it's it's not good. And then when it, when it drops, it takes forever for me to pull it back up again. Weird. I don't know why. You know, I can be supplemented and spend more time outside, and it still will not raise at the rate that I would like. It's like a year you know, to get it to pull up. That's a tricky one for me <clears throat> that, that kind of plays havoc. Um, my doctor, Serrano wants my DHEA high, you know, so that's another one that becomes tricky, but usually on me because I just forget to, to take it, you know, it's a, what? DHEA for me is the same way. I, I, I've supplemented with it before and it doesn't even move. And I'm the opposite with vitamin D, though. I can take a little bit, and it shoots through the roof. Like, it'll get up to 100 max on the scale. I've had to go over to 104, like over wow. normal. And I had to dial it back. I was taking 10,000, and it was like 104, and I dropped it to 5,000 I use a day, and it's at 90. So it's just crazy responder to that. But then DHEA for me is like the bottom of the reference range. So that's crazy because my DHEA will go up like that. Nothing. I was taking 60 to 80,000 D. And I couldn't get it to break 20. 
you see, some, <laughs> I've seen that with people though. I've seen people who can't like process vitamin D supplementation where I take a tiny bit and it just shoots up. But then DHEA, I could take a bunch and it wouldn't even move it. Yeah. Well, that's like, where it's it's cool to. Because then you, that's where you have the people at American. It's, you know, they can troubleshoot. Like maybe it's not that. Maybe there's something happening before that that's inhibiting your ability to accumulate it, you know, or store it or build it up. And we haven't found it with that. But in other cases, it's been that certain things wouldn't move that were supposed to. And um, you'll supplement it or try to change certain things and it doesn't move, but then it wasn't that that wasn't the primary cause of what it was. It was say iron or something else that, you know, shot it up through there. But <clears throat> I guess my point to dial it back is the importance of the labs are, are huge and you don't have to know all this stuff. There's people that do know it, you know, so, and there's also people that are geeking on it, you know, so you got videos where you're geeking on it. So, and I love that stuff too, because I'll geek on it when something's off, right? Because I don't have the greatest faith in the medical community, never have, even before everything that's gone on in the last few years. It's just, I always, if something's off, I wanna know, like, what's going on? And then you find the videos where people are geeking on it, like, okay, cool, this, yeah, but it allows you to ask better questions. You know, when you do speak to healthcare professional to be able to help with those things. I think that's a big part of it. I don't trust the, uh, some of my experiences with doctors over the years have been very subpar to where I'm like, I need to know this because it's crazy sometimes when you go in and they don't even know what something is and you're like, know all about it. And it's just very interesting because it's very by the book still. And much of this is newer stuff that they don't, they're not up to date on. That's way more accurate. Like they never, you, you go to the doctor's office, they're never gonna check apolipoprotein B. Even though it's a way bigger, predictor of heart disease and heart attack risk than LDL and HDL, where the new research is like L LDL and HDL aren't really telling us anything, but APO, APO B is, and they never even check it. Mm -hmm. Insulin, same thing, they never check it. And these are not expensive tests, so it's kinda, you need to be in command of your own health. You can't just go by your general practitioner what what they're gonna tell you guys. So like, I would try to educate yourself as much as possible. 100%, and it's, I think just the words alone, general practitioner is general. So they're gonna have general knowledge and everything, so not a lot. I think on the other end, when you're dealing with um, what are the specific, you know, what are the, ah, my, my brain, people that specialize in one area, you know, say cardio, cardio uh, cardiologist, even that's a generalist, but so say um, electrophysiologist, so even deeper, you know, with cardiologist, that's, that's what they know. Then they know the general of the cardiology, but then you start to get outside of that world. They don't know a lot. And I would make the argument, I don't want them to know a lot. I want them to know a lot about what their specialty is. But in a lot of the cases that I've had, they'll give me advice on things that are outside their specialty that they don't know anything about, which would be like my specialty being, you know, maximum strength development and then me trying to give people advice on yoga. I'm, I can wing it, but it's not gonna be real good. And that's kind of what they're doing. And um, I've learned over a period of time, I don't call them out on it. I just open the discussion kind of back towards where the area of specialty is. You know, or we'll say, well, now we're talking something that I'm more familiar with. Would you be interested in me sending you some research, you know, some content on this? The good ones will always say yes, right? Because it's almost like a check on there. And I get what they're doing because most of their patients don't know anything at all, you know, so they don't mean ill intent. They, they really, I don't care what anybody says, but they really don't mean ill intent. It's just, they're not super informed on that. And, but I think as patients, sometimes we expect too much out of them. We expect the generalist to know everything, right? And we expect the, the specialist to also know everything instead of what they really do know. 
Right? No, I think you're right. Be like yeah. going to a, like a, a generalist would be like going to a personal trainer for an advanced well, deadlift program for an all-time world record. Yeah, it's, <laughs> no, you're right. It's it's like if I was trying to educate people on how to be a better bodybuilder, I don't know what the heck I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Or diet. Like, I know all about blood work, but diet, I don't know. So I tell people straight up, I'm like, I don't know about diet. I can't give you a, a diet advice or a program, a nutrition program. Um, but like strength development, blood work, that's up my alley. I know all that stuff. Like, I love that stuff. But bodybuilding and, and nutrition, no. But, you know, so it is, it is like, what are you, what's your specialty as far as that? Um, have you ever had like a CT angiogram done mm -hmm. or like a, you have done that? Mm -hmm. That's, that's the next thing like I want to get done. I know there's something now called a clearly scan. It's like a thousand bucks and the, I'd have to drive to Lexington for it from Knoxville. So a little over two hours, but it would show like the actual plaque buildup and all that. And I, I wanted to get that checked out. No, I've had every heart test that you could possibly imagine I've had. So there's so many of them that they get just mixed kidding. in my head. Right. So, um, the, 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 the craziest one I had was there was one time when my heart was so bad, so far out of rhythm that they couldn't do a stress test. So they had to do a chemical stress test. This was whacked, right? Because they're basically injecting shit to be able to do the stress test while I'm there. But for some reason I started to see, I started to hallucinate and I saw like dinosaur cartoons, like in the fucking office. And it was freaking me out, you know, it was, and it went away fast as fuck, but it was, that was, that was one of the strangest ones where the, then there's the other one that I think it's a CT where they, it's, it's contrast, you know, so you, you feel like you're pissing the whole time and you're in this, like an MRI thing. You're like, God damn, you know, it's, you, you just, you're paranoid. Cause I, I, I'm, I'm, I swear to God, I'm going to piss. I, I, and I'm trying to tell them. I'm going to pee right now. And they're like, oh, no, you're not. No, you're not. But at the end, the information is, you know, way better than what you're going to get with an EKG or something like that. Did you did you have like a lot of plaque buildup or anything? No. That's no, good. Okay. No. Some like people don't. Ten percent. I mean, it was okay. it was. And that that um, when they did that one, that was when they went up through, you know, so they went through my groin up into the heart. Femoral. So they were scanning. Yeah. So they were scanning everything around there. And that was, a, that was a fucked up one too. Cause when I went into that one, they wheel me in and it's cold as fuck. And I, I believe the song on they had on the radio was the Rolling Stones Sympathy of the Devil, right? And I'm like, okay, this is fucked, right? And then while I'm in there, there's screens all over the place and they give me fentanyl. So I'm awake this whole time right and i'm seeing what they're doing and i'm awake and it's cool as hell but it's not because i'm like because the whole time i'm awake i'm like man if they just slip you know then i'm dead you know because it, it will go Gosh. through there you know and the <clears throat> the cardiologist is you know this looks pretty there this looks good it's like wow i remember him saying oh you got a little build up there and I said, uh, well, how much is it? And he said, I ah, like, you know, seven to 10 percent. I'm like, what does that mean? Like seven? Like what? Is, why not eight? Why not nine? Like I'm joking around. Like, what does that mean? And I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. Just in it. You know, you're in there. And it's like, it don't work that way because it's going to have backflow and all this other kind of stuff. And that was interesting. But with that, I was grateful when that was I wasn't grateful about any of these things. Looking back, you know, I was because now I, when you when you're in there you, you kind of know for sure. I mean, he's, he's fucking right there, you know, and I'm like, chip it away. You know, <laughs> I don't know shit about anything at this point. And, um, but that it was like two years of dealing with shit associated with that, with all those different tests, you know, and, um, they're interesting, you know, none of them were as bad as I thought. I will say that because you think it's going to be super, super bad, you know, it, I, once I said, so there's a TEE, they go down your throat and they do like a, scan you know of your heart you think that's gonna suck you know because they it's right that was before they gave me a cardio version so basically they paddle wow. you you know so and um this one i, I do remember because a good friend of mine's had like 40 cardio versions and <laughs> <laughs> you know what, the AFib what, is serious he's yeah oh yeah, yeah he's had it his whole life and you know and 
this is what I was dealing with at the time. And he's like, oh, man, that's no big deal. Just make sure they have you, you know, twilight it. You know, they knock you, kind of knock you out. Because once they did not twilight him. And he, oh, and he yeah, he said that's, you know, oh. an experience that you never want to never encounter. But with those, I had come out. It felt like a million bucks afterwards because yeah. you feel like shit going in. You oh, come yeah. out, you're like, oh, my God, you know, no person. My throat would be itchy. That was out of all the tests I ever had. That one, my throat would be rough after that. But I would always ask them how high I came off the table because they zap your ass, you know, and it's the, the record was like, I think she told me the highest I went was 10 inches. You know, they, they, you know, strap your arms and shit down, you still come off. They wouldn't film it. I wanted them to film it. Uh, uh, they won't do that. No, um, no. So, yeah. That's pretty cool, though. Unreal. Like, <laughs> how many cardio versions have you had? Probably under 10, but definitely probably seven or eight. It's real quick. They're fast with those things. It's fast, but some of the, the pain in the ass was sometimes they can't get you in as fast as you would like. And it's, you feel like trash. I know what you mean because yeah. everything I've heard, you feel like trash leading up to it. When you're in AFib, yeah. like your heart rate's higher, your resting heart rate, you, you feel run down. It's terrible. Um, For me, it was terrible. And then if the meds they put me on to control it made me feel even worse. So now you're in this fucked up state and then they, you got to get an appointment to be able to get this done. And then you have to be off the blood thinners for X amount of time beforehand. You know, so there's all these other things that kind of go around with that, where to me, it's just like, you know, it's out, fun, whack it, you know, let's get this over with. But my issue with all that is it never stayed, you know, oh. so it would stay for maybe, I think the longest it lasted was maybe a week. And really? then, yeah, then it was okay. We got it. We got to figure out a different solution you were on eloquist and all that the blood thinners what so that didn't work for you the cardio version never stuck mm -hmm. what the how'd they fix it i was ablated you know so they went through i've had um ablation for afib and ablation for flutter uh, okay. so both chambers basically they go yeah. through their freeze you know the area the heart that's got the that's signals the that are step. in there yeah and fortunately for me both of those i mean the first one was for the afib and that lasted about a year and then it went out, the other chamber goes out. So then it was for the flutter and then that one. And then shit, that was a while ago now. Okay. So long time ago, the, but the, the path I was looking at was the, it was persistent and it was bad, you know? So AFib's not, I don't want to say it's not a big deal, but for most people, it's not a big deal, right? It's, it's, there's way worse things that you can have to deal with than that. For a lot of people, just a one cardio version is pretty much it. Some people is just controlled with cardio versions or meds or what. Mine wasn't, you know, mine was, you know, it didn't stick when it was cardio verted. And then the meds were, made me feel like I wanted to just be dead, you know? And then if I didn't have the meds, I wanted to be dead because the resting heart rate was like 181. <laughs> You know, so, oh but it's God, different dude. when it's that high, it's different. Like, Holy it's not like shit. you feel it. You just feel tired as fuck. You don't feel like you think you feel like you think you're going to, uh, you know, be all amped up, but you're just tired as fuck. That's it. It's not what you think. You just can't move. You can't don't want to do anything. Then the meds would control it. Then you don't want to do anything. So both sides of the teeter totter were a fucking disaster. And so that's where the path of the ablations went okay so this is one of my guys that i train he's 65 i believe and he just had the cardio version mm -hmm. and he said the same thing like he felt so run down and tired when he had when he had afib mm -hmm. and then the meds also like killed his strength like killed his strength mm -hmm. he's like dude i can't even lift heavy it's right bad. now like it's so bad so it's kind of like they're both not good you know um but yeah, that's that's super relatable because the ablation is the next step if the cardio versions don't. Yeah, the, the meds. It's I mean, it's just made me feel terrible. So just that aside, I just felt terrible. Now, if I'm talking about training, you know, and the stuff I was doing there, nothing has ever made me feel as weak as they did. Yeah, I mean, bad, bad. I mean, like five pound dumbbell curl, bad, like bad. You know, and I'm trying everything to be able to hold on to whatever I can, but it was just, it was bad, you know, and it was, but that was the least of my concerns well, at that yeah. time. You know, you still want to exercise, 
and do what you can, but you know, the exercise becomes very questionable with all that too, because your heart rate, heart rhythm is being controlled with meds. So what exactly am I gonna do, you know, cardiovascular wise, you know, to be able to, and that's where you're working with a physical therapist and stuff like that to try to get answers and nobody has answers there. I mean, it was just a fucking mess. You know, it was, it was a mess. See, this ties into like, okay, here's another thing with the weight loss I've had in the running. Okay, here's one of my main motivations. I've completely spaced on this, but this is honestly probably one of the main motivations. I can't sleep well for crap at 240. Like when I'm 240, like last time I was in here, even being natural, um, or not being on any drugs, PED free, like my sleep was awful. I'd wake up, I felt run down all day. And now being in this weight range, I sleep like a rock. I don't wake up at all. I get so much more REM. It's so much better. Like I hate CPAPs. I, I can't stand mm -hmm. them. I'm not going to wear a CPAP. I'm not, I'm going to be straight up. Like they, I have one, they can give it to me. They can tell me this is going to prolong your life. You need to wear it. I will I still won't do it. I'll just freaking rip it off and I hate it and I, I, I can't do it. So for me, this was like a necessary evil where I'm like, I'm no, I'm not going to wear the CPAP. So I should just lose weight to a point where I no longer have sleep apnea. That's what I've done. And like, that I sleep so much better where it's worth it. It's, it, it. The quality of sleep has gone up so much that that motivation alone is like, yeah. I'll well, we could circle this. back now though and say that that has to have some impact on your testosterone levels. That's true. That's I, that's something I kind of spaced yeah, on, yeah. but you're right. If I'm not sleeping necessarily as many hours as I should, because yeah. I got to wake up and open the gym, but the quality, the amount of REM much higher. I'm not waking up to pee every night. I sleep through the night. Um, all this stuff, it, it very well could have had an impact. So that's a, that's another possible. So how are you not waking up to pee? Because how would that change based upon body weight? It's like your body's more efficient. Like I have less body fat. I just, it's everything's operating more efficiently. That's what I, my thought process is. Like I, I'm, I'm really pretty freaking lean right now. So I think that makes it to where it's just like the whole system runs yeah. smoother. Um, but the sleep apnea, they say it's tied into waking up to pee. I don't know, like the neck size and all that. I, yeah. I've tried to shrink down, um, which I have, and, and, and that's made a difference. The other thing, the resting heart rate, this is crazy. So resting heart rate taken, resting when you're asleep. So a true resting heart rate isn't just us sitting here. It's the number of our heart, what it's at when we're yeah. asleep. Yeah. So mine was back in February, like 58. Mm -hmm. um, now, 38. Mm. 20 freaking beats in four months from a dropping 30 plus pounds and extensive cardio and, and losing body fat. And I feel so good nowadays. Like I feel so good. I couldn't go back. I couldn't go back to a heavier body weight because I just feel awesome. Like That's this is just drop. because I'm, it's, yeah. I'm just functioning. The whole system is functioning better. Now I still want to get the scan done like you've had because mm -hmm. I want to see the plaque build up because I don't know. I have terrible genetics for heart disease. Um, I brand trend I'm a million years, so uh, there very well could be plaque buildup, and I want to get that checked out. That'd be the next step, mm -hmm. like peace of mind to know. Wouldn't a calcium score tell you that though? The, well, the thing with here's what they say about the calcium score. They say the calcium score is like a 10 year delay. So if you get a calcium score done now at 31, it'll show your calcium levels at like 21 or whatever. Um, I had one done when I was 27 after. Uh, you know, after I got off trend, I had one done and it was like a two. And I'm thinking like, oh, it's a two. It's really low. That's great. And they're like, yeah, you shouldn't have any at all before 30. Mm -hmm. So there was definitely something going on there. And I have the predisposition with the high LP little a and my, you know, heart attacks, heart disease, all in my family, diabetes, all that kind of stuff. So I want to get that done to see the current state, how much calcium buildup is there. Yeah. So I don't know that much about the calcium score. I just know what other people I've never they never did that for me. It was always this other things, but I always hear other people talk about it, which is to me, it was always weird because it's like, ah, you know, I've had issues and they never did that. Because <laughs> apparently the calcium score is not as good as thought to be like it shows it too late. So mm -hmm. it's like showing damage from years ago, but it won't show present damage. So it's not very accurate in telling you how things are actually now. That's why they say like, it's not even worth it. Mm -hmm. Especially at a younger age, they say it's pointless. Um, 
it has more merit once you get into your 40s and 50s, but it's still delayed. So the, the complete accurate synopsis is like the CT angiogram. Mm -hmm. That just shows the plaque right now. Here's your heart attack risk. You have a 70% blockage. Well, that's likely to rupture, like that kind of stuff. So I just want to know, but I'm also like trying to overcome and say like Peter Atia, do you, are you familiar? Yeah. That guy, he's so fascinating because he's, he's brought this VO2 max thing to into, you know, normalcy like no one talks about it now it's a big thing so i'm always like i gotta get a vo2 max pr i'm always trying to get it higher because it shows how good a shape you're in it shows how well your body can process oxygen basically and how good your cardiovascular um how system is so that's been something like i'm always trying to drive that number up where i'm and this it moves slow as molasses it's like trying to get your bench max up well as that's gotten better have you seen it correlate to any differences for you Oh yeah, like I feel better, I'm faster runner, I uh, blood pressure goes down, heart rate goes down, like you get leaner. So basically like VO2 max goes up, when your body fat gets lower, you get leaner, you lose weight, um, your heart rate goes down, your blood pressure goes down, all your biomarkers on blood work go down. It's, it's like directly correlated, like the higher it gets, the better shape you're in, the healthier. It's, it's 100%, everything gets better. So running improves that VO2 max, and as that gets better, I feel better, I sleep better, everything. So that's why he's like, this is such an important thing. Like people need to like get this as high as they can and focus on it. Mm -hmm. Where he's, he said something about the top 5% of the population, if you're in that percentile, so the 95th percentile, if you're in that, you have a five times lower risk of all cause mortality from like heart disease, cancer, everything. Your chance of dying from anything is five times lower than everybody else, if you're in that elite, percentage but to get to the top five percent is like it's I'm, I'm in the top 15 for my age but like five is like you would have to put in some serious work mm -hmm. i mean you have to drop down to where you have zero body fat and you're just like in ridiculous shape so that's not even attainable for most people which is why i kind of feel like it's a weird proxy to be like yeah you got in the, yeah i'm like 99 percent well 95 aren't gonna be able yeah, to yeah yeah <laughs> You have to have no body fat and be like in elite cardio shape to even get to that. I mean, but wouldn't that come with its own negatives though, which would be outside of that, I would think. Like, well, no, no, because you're talking all cause mortality is what he's going off of. Yeah, but I'm like, do you know how elite 5% is, the top 5% for that? Oh yeah. That'd be like me at a 55 VO2 and it's it's 51 now but it, 55 like the the going from 51 to 55 is like going from a 600 pound deadlift to eight mm -hmm. or, or it's it's not in the ballpark you know it's like that's really hard for a lot of people so i don't know how if he said like oh if you're in the top 25th percentile that would make more sense but five percent isn't even something unless everyone just turns into like. Well, have you looked back on to why where, where he's coming up with this recommendation and where it comes from? Is I mean, is this just? No, I haven't. I, I trust the guy. I'm like yeah. he's very well known, and yeah. But I haven't like dug into it. But I'm yeah. I'm just saying like, unless everyone's gonna go out and run 50 miles a week and get to six percent body fat, how the heck are they gonna get into that range? Exactly. It'd be more applicable if you said okay you could stay at 15% body fat and get in pretty good shape and get into the 25th per top 25th percentile. So that for me, that throws up like my bullshit detector. Like, okay, sure, anybody can say that because how many people can actually do it? So no. it's easy to come back and say. It's like, yeah, just go pull, just go pull 850. Like, <laughs> yeah. Nobody's gonna go pull 850. <laughs> but I, 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 I wanna you know, preface things yeah, though. I really yeah, like yeah. the guy. Yeah, I no, do. I get what you're saying. But I, but I do look at that where I'm like, I'm on that journey now and I mm -hmm. realize how hard that is. And I'm like, most people aren't gonna do that. Like, mm -hmm. Do you know how much you gotta put in to get to that level? So that's the only thing where it doesn't seem as applicable, but it's kind of cool. Yeah, let's take a bathroom break real quick. <clears throat> sure. Yeah. Today's episode is brought to you by First Detachment. Are you looking for a supplement brand that truly understands hardworking athletes? Look no further than First Detachment. Wendy's real world experience is what I would consider and they consider battle tested. I have known Justin Harris for pretty close to two decades. And if there's anybody that I trust with nutritional and supplement needs, it's Justin Harris. If you guys have followed me and have followed the podcast, you pretty much already know how I feel about the supplement industry. For me to get behind any brand, 
I have to trust the brand and I have to trust the person both. And I'm pretty sure you guys all know why. When it comes to creating formulas and putting products on the market, and there's nobody that I trust more than Justin Harris. While I love all of their products, I'd suggest that you check out the Field Rations and WTH first. Go to www.firstdetachment.com and use the code TABLETALK10 to save 10% off each order. The link is in the description. All right, guys, I want to thank today's sponsor, Element. I'm having fun with ads now instead of just trying to like read through all the talking points and so forth. But there's a talking point here I have to read through. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink with everything that you need and nothing you don't. That means lots of salt and no sugar. For some reason, that just makes me laugh. I've had and have been in the habit of drinking a half a pack before every leg training session and all my cramping issues that I had went away because I've always had cramping issues on heavy leg days and leg days especially. Why do you, how do, you, how do your quads cramp doing seated leg curls? But All right, guys, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Merrick Health. If you've been following the podcast for a while, you'll know that Merrick was the first company to step up and help support the Table Talk podcast. You guys are selecting Merrick for your telehealth platform needs, but it also tells me that they're providing the service that you're all looking for. They have a couple different ways that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. So you go to the link in the description box. So there's a table talk panel, which is the full panel. That would be the panel that I personally get twice a year, but probably is more suggested to get that full panel once a year. That's checking everything. Optimal performance, longevity, health, hormones, you name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup panel. You don't need to have the full panel every single time you have blood. I get my blood work done on a quarterly basis. So once a year, there's a full panel. Sometimes there's even more than that. And then there's the checkup panel, which is going to be every three or four months. With a guided optimization, you're connected with a patient care coordinator. And the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine what your needs are what you're looking for. Anything to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment like you would have if you go to see your physician now. So the discount code again is Table Talk. The link is in the description box. Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs. The Swiss Symposium 2023. Yes, we are bringing this back to Columbus again. The date is October 20 and 21. Columbus, Ohio, Hilton, it's the same location it was last year. If you head over to the website, there's a big banner that links directly to Swiss. There's also a link in the description box so you can see who the presenters are as we are booking them for the symposium. The symposium has been going on for 20 years. It's, in my opinion, probably a little biased, but in my opinion, one of the best symposiums when it comes to strength and conditioning, uh, sport medicine, therapy, physical therapy. Right now, the admission is 38% off or 48% off. It's I'm don't know. I'm not looking. I'm just kind of looking at the camera right now, but it's the early, early, early bird rate. That rate is until July 1st. So now is the best time for you to sign up. When you go to register, there's three different ways that you can res register for the symposium. There's the general admission, which gets you into all the different lectures that you want to go to. The caveat is there's three or four lectures going on at the same time. So the second option allows you to purchase the videos of all the lectures for you to be able to watch at a later time. So that allows you and gives you access to everybody that's presenting if there's two people presenting at the same time that you would really like to see. The format that those are in is, it's a streaming service. So it's, it's, 
if you've ever purchased a training course from anybody before, it's very similar to that. So you log in and then there's all the presentations that are there. You just click, you watch, you stream. It's how it works. The third option is the VIP option. And included in that is the Sunday after the symposium, a limited number of people will be coming out to our gym, the S5 compound at Elite FTS with a handful, maybe a little bit more of the presenters that are there just to train, to hang out, have some barbecue, have a good time. And that again is limited on the attendance. It's already 50% sold out or 50% of the spots left, depending on how you want to look at it, go to the link in the description. We'll have more information about the Swiss throughout the podcast. As we move forward, we have a lot of the presenters booked for the podcast. So we'll be talking more about it. We'll see you there. As I want to call out the limited edition apparel, the link is in the description. As I spoken about before the limited edition apparel is apparel that i basically come up with so some of the designs suck some of them not so much it's a weird thing the ones that i think are going to do really well usually don't the ones that i think aren't going to do really well do really well either way they're all limited runs so it changes you know every single month but all limited edition items are tri-blend material with you know the cut that everybody wants now that's a little bit tighter on their arms so they can show off how big their fucking arms are the limited edition items directly support the podcast so head over pick up your shirt today could be a hoodie could be shorts we got these ball hugger shorts right now which i would never wear but i was told they were super popular but you know what they were wrong because they're still sitting there and i probably should discount them right now anyhow if you want to see the discount on the ball hugger shorts head over over, over to the limited edition apparel link in the description box how many carbs was that 100 per meal all right, we're back. So it was 100 per meal every two hours, and it'd be shoveled in with that other stuff. So it was just... 1,200 carbs a day. Mm -hmm. I did nine, and nine sucked. Nine was, like, hard. And 12 sucked. I mean, 12 was, like, waking yeah. up a little bit earlier than you normally would, and then going to bed a little later. So I'm getting a couple extra that way, and then throughout the day. Very, very interesting. The... Um, I want to go to a question I asked you beforehand that was from the Discord because the answer, your answer wasn't what I thought it was going to be. So I think other people can benefit from that. And it was about the back raises, the 45 degree back raises. And the way the question was asked was at the top, should you, I don't want to say overextend, but should you arch harder at the top or just stop at neutral? And your answer was to arch harder. So go into a little bit more detail for that. Yeah, so in my opinion, based on my experiences with it, that extra little hyperextension at the top of the 45 degree back extension is where you're gonna get a lot of the benefits. So it's gonna make it to where you're not gonna be able, be able to do as much weight. Like a lot of guys cut it short and they'll kind of just, they'll go to like parallel or a little short and it's so much easier. But when you get that extra arching, that hyperextension at the top, you're getting way more hamstring activation. The glutes have to work a lot harder. There's just more posterior chain benefit. So you'll find if you go from maybe where you're at the neutral point to where you're getting that little extra hyperextension, it's actually a lot tougher to hold that position. But you should try to aim to do that and then pause it there. And that's where the, the glute and hamstring activation goes through the roof. So I think that's spot on. That's what you want to do. I think the key to what you just said there is to pause it there. Right, because what I'm, what I would worry about are the, are the, the people who are gonna, you know, they're just gonna whack up there, and then slam down. Where if you gotta pause it, it's gonna have, it becomes more controlled. Exactly. At that top part, you know, because they gotta hold it. People go too fast on those. You almost, um, not. I, I never tell people to lift slow. I think it's terrible. Like you want to lift fast to lift maximum weights, but sometimes people will try to speed through those too quickly. They'll try to pace it too fast and it's like it should be controlled enough to where a big mistake i see is they rush it to where they're uh they start bending at the knee joint so their their legs will start becoming unlocked if the legs become unlocked you're taking the hamstrings out of it which is the whole freaking point of the exercise so you want the legs to be completely locked out with the feet slightly turned out and you want to go slow enough to where you keep your legs locked even at that extra hyper extension when the legs start on start bending you're taking the hamstrings out of it. That's the whole point. Like, I know it hits a lot of low back. I get that. But 
I was mainly doing it for hamstring activation. So why would you take out the, the hardest part? Yeah. Like don't go so fast that your legs become, you know, unbuckled and, and you, you lose that tension. Like, I'm going to change the topic here because it's, I had it in my notes here and I got to commend you on it. You put the washer and dryer back in your videos, yeah. you know, which is behind. Did it help the <laughs> Did it help the views? No. no. It was like a cool thing. I'm like, yeah. Well, I, I don't have much of a bad. I was like, I got to go from just a plain wall background to like something. Like, mm -hmm. it's my, my, that room is tiny, so I can't like fit anything in there. So it's just like this dungeon type room. And I, I had to spice it up a little bit. It's not going to move the needle too much. But so as you've been putting content out, since or the last time and even it was a little bit before how is not the comments but what what are the people who are following you what do they want you to speak about what are they asking you about i guess that's a better way to ask this i'm trying i mean i think the majority of it is still strength focused because that's the whole that's what my whole uh audience was built upon that's the yeah. pillar but I'm trying to pivot it a little more towards this more hybrid lifestyle of health where I'm like, okay, just because you're going to run and do cardio and, and, and shrink down or whatever, doesn't mean you have to be weak. So that's kind of where I'm trying to pivot. It's like, you can still lift pretty heavy and be strong and have a good physique. Um, but you can at the same time have the health and all that. So that's, that's the direction I'm going now where there's going to be more interest from that side of things. And I'll lose some of the initial, just purely strength based powerlifting pursuit people but you know your interests are going to shift in life too and that's kind of where i'm at so it's like i'm not going just switching sides it's just i'm trying to bring it all together integrate it which i feel like um nick bear is almost a prime example of that not that his lifts are crazy but he's the guy who's jacked with the good physique who's also crazy fast and i'm like that's what i want to be well i think at the same point if you're a creator for lack of knowing what else to call it you never want to get stuck into feeding the followers. I don't want to say what they want, but you're telling your life story as a creator. Basically. Right. So, and that's the whole point, you know, of creating the content, to be completely honest, because you're not making a fortune doing it, you know, so it, it's that. So if, I think as soon as the creator, again, for lack of a better word, gets stuck into not telling their own journey, but they, they stop at this one and then just go on auto repeat, you know, keep reliving the past, then it's not going to last long anyhow. And those people that have been following for a long time, they're also not doing the same things that they were doing a decade ago either. Well, and it's not authentic when you're forcing it and you're like, you know, I, I think what's happened to what I've seen is a demographic shift to where I, you know, everybody who used to follow me was teens and 20s, mm -hmm. young guys, young guys who wanted to get stronger and all that. My demographic has shifted completely to like now it's later 20s, 30s and 40s. Like that's my demographic now. It's guys with a family, guys with kids, guys who don't have all the time in the world. They can't train for four hours like I used to do, who want to be healthy at the same time. That's where the shift has been. I've seen it. It's it's a whole different demographic. It's people who relate to this. They're like, okay, you got a family, I've got a family. I don't have a lot of time. You know, I wanna be efficient, I wanna be healthy, I wanna be strong. Well, it's a, it's a, it can also be the same demographic that you had before, they just got older too. That's exactly right, you they've know, grown so up with you. So they've grown up with that, where on the content side, though, where that gets, where it gets weird is, there is a younger demographic coming up, which you don't want to ignore, yeah. right? Because eventually they get older, then they fall in that demographic range. But they're still always going to be attracted to the bait of the people that are their age that are doing the things that they want to do. You yeah. know, the same way when you were younger, they were following you because you're closer to that same age, more relatable in that realm, where there, there's a whole crew of people that have filled that spot. Yeah, you know, I'm not that yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, that, that, they, they've, they've, they've done that. Where the cool thing with YouTube especially, and we talked about this last time for different reasons that, you know, I was on there for different reasons, you know, than people that were trying to build the YouTube for different reasons, is it's an archive too. It's a huge archive of information that's out there that the... 
I don't want to say smarter people, but the more, I don't want to say research, the people who are more passionate, let's say about deadlifting or powerlifting are going to go see what were they doing, like what were you doing 10 years ago to be able to, as well as what's being done now. And then the smart, this is where I'll say the smart ones, the smart ones are going to say, what's the same? Good point. Right? That's because awesome. Because that's yeah. the answer. That's where when we get inundated with, oh, the information overload, you know, I come back and say, not really, because there's a lot of clues if you know how to look. That's good. Where right? It's like, what's stuck? What is the, what were they saying 10 years ago that they're still saying? Yeah. That's the key. Because things do change. Your views on something that you're like, that was awesome before, it might shift now. Yes. Uh, and, and the younger oh. as, you know, it's, say I'm in a generation that above when you came up, you guys are learning from what we did. So it's like, yep. hey, that's fucking cool. That looks dumb as fuck. I'm not doing that, but I'm going to do this, right? Yeah. So then that group was stronger. Same thing is happening with the people that are coming up under you. It's like, hey, that was cool. That looks stupid as fuck, but this was cool. And then, you know, they learn, you know, from each, if they're willing to look what's good, what's not, you know, and that kind of stuff. And that archive is actually really, really cool if they take the time to go down those rabbit holes to be able to see because it's it's so good. We didn't have that, right? You were one of the first people to be putting this shit up there. It wasn't like you had 20 years of people pulling deadlifts in a basement somewhere, like Ed Cohen. Or, think how cool that would have been. Yeah. Right. So you'd have all that to be able to go off of. Now they got, what, three decades of different levels, different, you know, Generations. Generations, right? Of fuck ups. And I mean, the same thing could be said with PEDs. Like now it's like oh, yeah. there's way more dialed into what, like, oh, that was stupid. He shouldn't do that, but I could do this. So people are better utilizing PEDs on a much more efficient basis these days than when I was starting, you know, starting out doing it because it was so underground. We talked about that. Now it's all out there. Mm -hmm. So, like, if I, man, like the advantage these guys have now, honestly, like if I knew how to run PEDs to this degree back then. I'm like, man, I wish I would have done it different. But it, there was some basic steroid forums and stuff out there. Uh, and I think part of it is youth. Like even youth, you could read like, this is the most efficient way. And you're just gonna be like, no, I'm gonna try this and take all this. So even that goes back to sometimes experience is the best, you know, teacher. So that's not necessarily the case, I suppose, because just in your 20s, you're not going to listen a lot of times. No, and it's, it's I, actually I just had this conversation with somebody two days ago that is younger, and it's and it's realizing that <clears throat> the exact conversation was, look, I know where this edge is, and I know you're going to go over the edge and fall, right? All I'm trying to do is to provide a little cliff under the edge so you don't fall all the way to the bottom. But I'm okay with you going to that edge and falling, Yeah. right? Because you're going to do it even if I tell you not to. So I'm gonna build it into what you're doing intentionally, right? And so don't do, you. There, there's no need to do more because it's already fucking ridiculous what's there. It's already over and above. So an example I'll give you, which you'll understand, is um, it's more of a linear, the type of thing that I have them on. So the first week I had five sets of five and I didn't put any weight percentages or anything like that because I know what they're going to do. We all know what they're going to do. So I let it on there. So guess what week two was? 20% less weight than week one. Ah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> right? So it's like, okay, I know exactly yep. what all of you are going to do. So now we can build from here. You know, overshoot. Yeah, because you know they're going to. Well, we're all like that. I've yeah. known better. I'm not. That's why I'm like, guys, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm not going to say, don't do PDs, don't take trend. Like, I abused the hell out of trend. It was great times. It was, it was <laughs> not great times. It was good and bad. <laughs> yeah, don't don't ask my wife. But, like, <laughs> it was it was good and bad times, you know? it was. But I'm saying, like, I could tell some guy, like, oh, yeah, don't do trend, you know? And they're going to freaking do it. Like, that's the thing. I think we're I think we're on the same page. We're like we're trying to steer you in a good direction to kind of uh, somewhat help you, but we know you're gonna do it. Yeah. I can't be like, yeah, guys, uh, wait till you're 25 to take to take juice when I did it at 20. You know. Yeah. It's like I know you're gonna do it. It's 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 acceptable. I get it. Um, and I'm, I'm I'm like that. I'm just programmed like that. Like you could say, don't do that. But until I screw up and feel the pain of screwing up from it, I don't know. I don't learn. I learn from mistakes. It's, well, it's, some people are just die, are just um, it's just born that way. I think 
Yeah, do you, you learn know? from mistakes or do you learn from someone telling you? Mistakes, I hate, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. I've always hated when people tell me shit. Like, I hated when teachers would tell me in grade school, get in line. Like, fuck you, I'm not getting in line. It was just getting in line to go to lunch. I'm like, fuck you. Because they get all mad, right? Because people wouldn't get in line. So I would purposely just sit there. So I would be last in line because fuck, I don't know where that comes. You know, I don't know where that came from, but it's like, fuck you. I'm not, you know, I, now there's other people, it's, it's different mentalities. You know? Maybe, do you think part of that, though, is that, uh, there's not enough of an explanation of why? Like, if you gave really good reasons why, okay, don't do this, don't wait till you're 25 to take PEDs for the, all these good yeah. reasons. Maybe we're not explaining it good enough to them where they deem it to make sense. 100%. The podcast I had with um, Wendler and Desenzio the other day, Vincent was saying something about, and it was a teaching perspective, and... <clears throat> And how they were explaining all that, and it kind of hit me like, you know, I would, I would have, I would have, I would, I would have done that, you know, I, I would have complied, you know, I, I would have done that, had it been done that way, you know, but it's not. So it, it's definitely how the message is being put out there. So I wonder, things like that will creep up on me. We're all, I'll stop and pause and say, well, how exactly? is the message being projected and it gets weird when it's a podcast because the audience is all over the place so who exactly is the target audience you're trying to project to because you can't speak to everybody and how can it be reframed because personally i don't think somebody under 25 should be using peds if they're i really don't and that's just because I think it's going to hurt their long-term potential as a lifter. I've seen it too many times. You know, it's, you've seen, we've all seen it. You know, it's like, you know, fuck, if you just waited three more years, the, your last three years would have been way better and way stronger than... Nobody has ever disagreed with me when I said that. But we all will say, it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I I think even for me, I'm like, if I had waited, I think I would have hit a higher total. I know, I it, know it, you would. If I hadn't jumped on trend like that quick, if I'd been like, okay, I'm gonna st even if I was like, I'm gonna start PDs, I'm gonna take testosterone, I'm gonna take D ball, I'm gonna take Deca, and I was like, but I'm gonna wait two years, three years to start trend. If I'd done that, I probably would have done better. But I was just like, oh, I gotta try trend right away and all this. Like it was pretty quick. You know, so I so, think my theory on it. It's, it's many fold, but one of my theories on it is you don't learn how to overcome sticking points in your training. No. Because you first hit the sticking point, then you take drugs, that's how you overcome. So you don't learn that better programming could help. Oh, no. Eating more food could help. Better help training at a different time of the day. Technique. You know, all these things you don't learn because that's the first car that you pull. And, um, that's the biggest thing. The other thing, I just think that there's, and I have nothing to back this up. There's a time period where this shit really, really helps you. Maybe a decade or something like that. You know, it's just whatever it is. Where it's optimally just going to do the best for you it possibly can. And if you push like four or five of those years too soon, it's taken away. You know, it's... I think the, the optimal time is like 25 to 35 mm -hmm. for a strength athlete. Now, they got to build strength and muscle mass and all that before they're 25. But if they can push that PED window right there, yep. then that's when they can specialize, you know, because they've built mass, they've built strength, they know the, the training, they know how to overcome sticking points, then bam. They got five really, really good years where you're almost indestructible. 25 to 30 and then another five to where eh, you're going to get beat up a little bit but not so bad that it's going to hurt anything that much and then maybe you expend it out the back end of that and it's just like i said i have nothing to really validate this except everybody i've ever spoken to is like fuck that makes sense to me and i i would agree 25 to 35 would be that ideal range because i've seen a lot of guys in that like 33 range who are like peaking in terms of strength and um, I think we all follow the progression too of with PEDs, we start out with like, okay, 
we'll start out with just testosterone or SARMs or something, and then we climb higher to where we're taking a lot more. We're trying other compounds, Anadrol, D-Ball, and we take a ton, and then we get to a point in our life where we're just on the back end. We start taking less and less, and then we go to just testosterone. And so it's like this, this wave. It's yeah. like you, you come up, you come down. And then maybe when you're 35 to 40, you're like, okay, I'm just going to do TRT. I know I'm not going to lift what I once did, but I need to be healthier. And it's just, it's this progression. So that's kind of relatable. Um, and I did that too. Like I was like, all right, I got to stop taking trend. This is really jacking me up. And I came off that and it was just other stuff. And then it, I dropped the other stuff and here I am. So, but when the trend came in, what was that trajectory like fast? the strength trajectory it was mm -hmm. just like it just blew up i mean trend gave me gains that nothing else could so i loved uh, i love that feeling of it i love the aggression the intensity i would always have you felt in, you felt invincible basically so that was that was nice but it was just too much of a burden to carry around on a daily basis to where you have that kind of energy 24 7. like that energy is good in the gym but that energy is too much mm -hmm. to be walking around day in and day out with it's just it's overkill and uh there, were, there was good and there was good and bad. There was good in the gym, bad outside of the gym. Yeah. The strength was crazy. The nothing gave me strength like that. I responded. So that was that well. strength that you got was better than your first cycle? Trend, yeah, it just kept coming. Like it was like it was always there. Um, I mean, I'm trying to look back. I would say it was for me. Wow. I was a very high responder to trend. Wow. But I could take Halo tests and nothing. Yeah. So every compound was different. Yeah, everybody's, everybody's different, but that's crazy to think about, right? Because the first cycle is always like the one you chase for the rest of your life after that. Every trend cycle. <laughs> <laughs> I could feel it, though. I can, I can feel it. Like, feel the feeling of like, wow, this is a different level than just a normal cycle. That's what it felt like. So I know not everybody experiences that. Like, yeah. you hear all the crazy trend stories, and those are the guys who are the high responders to trend. That was like me. And some people are just like, yeah, it gives me a little boost. And, you know, so everybody's different. Um, people say Anadrol gives them a crazy boost. For me, I talked about it was nothing. Um, but for Trent, it just, I responded so well to it where it was crazy. And uh, the other guys I was lifting around, they loved Deca and D-Ball. So it's yeah. just everybody, each their own. Um, some people love pro hormones. Like pro hormones were giving crazy. A lot of, a lot of my early years, like, you know, Pro hormones were giving guys better strength than straight up steroids like testosterone with DECA or D ball. Yeah, but was the shit fake? I don't know. I think it was because remember the old super draw? A good oh, yeah, 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 oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my gosh. It was steroids, anyhow. Super draw was yeah. ridiculous yeah. back in the day. Getting it like we talked about off Amazon back. That was, <laughs> that was good stuff. It was very strong. So you could have insane gains on that as well. But. You know, now I hear about, I've seen it with a few of my guys. I have never personally ran it, but I hear it's its almost super droll like strength gains is uh, Rad 140. Rad 140, the SARM, people say that's just insane, like better gains than D-ball, Anadrol, and all that. I've just, I've never tried it because it was kind of more newer when I was getting mm -hmm. out of it. But I've seen guys blow up on Rad 140. No, I've not heard of that. It's, it's just like the strongest SARM, yeah. I want to say. So you got like Osterine, you got mm -hmm. some other ones, but um, MK677, different pathways. No, those I've heard of, but that... Yeah, RAD 140. Yeah. So That's, that would be more what, though? More androgenic, more anabolic? Yes, I, I guess it's more like androgenic. And I've seen guys get stronger off that than, than Anadrol. Wow. It's real, the real deal. I just don't know much about it because I've never obviously tried it. It was it was too new when I was. It's, it's it's newer, but that is giving people and you can buy that legally online. I'm pretty sure. Not to say that anybody should do that, but like. No, no, I shouldn't do it at all. It's just it's just one of those things where I'm literally commenting. You're like nobody's gonna do this. <laughs> I'm commenting on my experiences with what I've seen, like what yeah. I've seen other guys. Yeah. Some of my clients. I need to give a shout out to Nathan Payton when he was out here. Remember when I was telling you earlier that if you don't dilute this element shit it will take a cramp away and this isn't even meant to be a sales plug this is just my fucking left hamstring was just cramping like a motherfucker and i put a whole pack in like this much and slammed it and the hamstring cramp just went the fuck away yeah i believe i mean i tried element once 
and it, I, I got a packet from somebody. They gave it to me. I had took it before a run. I was like, God, I had a freaking awesome run. I felt good. So. Well, he was saying that like I gotta get if you, you know, obviously you don't want to cramp. You want to have the sodium before to prevent all that. But if you're on the back end and it's locked up, that the more that the more dilution that it's in, like in the whole, it probably isn't going to do shit. But if basically you just put it a little bit, pound it, it will take it away. Just quick. And it did. It just took it away. Quick normally it's like, yeah, normally you, you had the fucking post-workout cramps oh, yeah. just like a mother especially your cramp hams or the adductors you know the quads it just just went away it's fucking crazy as fuck i'll get after i do those back extensions or uh nordic hamstring curls after i do those that night i'll be laying in bed i could be sound asleep and at some point i'll just wake up like my hamstring locking up and you got the covers on you can't get them off so you're trying to rip them off and your hamstrings just going crazy. That's always fun. No, those are terrible. Oh, I know man. what those are. It's always the calf for the hamstring. Yeah, the hamstring. It's the the worst is the um, the vastus medialis. Oh god. You know that crazy. that hits. It's actually kind of cool because you're like, wow, you didn't know you had one, right? You didn't know it looked <laughs> like that, and you're like, holy shit. Then it just like a motherfucker, and then you try to stretch it, and then your hamstring cramps. Because the stretch, you got it's just a nightmare. Anyhow, you probably shouldn't get into the state where you got to shotgun the shit. But yeah, when he told me, I'm like, nah. I, I like half believed it, you know. Because when you're in that cramp state, there's not a whole lot you can do except just pray. Yeah, you gotta wait it out. Just hope the fuck it goes away. It just went away. So it needs to happen again for me to be 100% definitive on it. But I'll tell you what, I'm. It worked. Yeah, got it done. So it's, it's done. It sidetracked me on the whole thing because I didn't think I'm, I'm like, fuck, I got a hamstring cramp. I'm going to have to fake a pee break to stretch it. But I didn't have to want it with the fuck away. Anyhow, that all aside, we I had I had trend down here as one of my topics, you know, for this. Yeah, it's always great. You know, which always kind of comes in there with that. So you touched on that with what are. God, what did somebody ask me about the other day? Because uh, a lot of this stuff now, like I know Trent, a lot of this other stuff I don't know shit about, right? Because it's, I've been on TRT for 10 fucking years and I don't pay it. It's not like the lifters I work with. I'm like, dude, what are you taking? I, yeah. I, re I really don't want to know. Okay. Like they can just figure that out. I don't want to be a part of that. You can tell if it's too much. Yeah. And you can say, dude, look, like, what the fuck? I really don't want to know. But shit will pop up. And I'll be like, what the fuck is, like, what you just, I don't know what that is. Oh, like, right. Somebody the other day was talking about um, mint. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. So, gosh, what does that stand for? Because there's a few names for it. Yeah. Um, well, maybe if I knew the other names, I might. Mint, mint. It's, is that like trust alone? I don't know. It sounded to me like the action was like a check drop. Yeah, like Trestalone. I, have you heard of Trestalone? Yeah. Have you ever taken Trestalone? No. Trestalone, I, this stuff is hilarious. This is a funny story. Trestalone, I got some from this guy, another lifter. He's like, yeah, man, uh, take one pill. It's an oral. Take it before each, each attempt in the meet. So you got nine attempts. You're going to take nine of them. He's like, dude, it'll give you crazy aggression. Take it before each, each attempt. And uh, I started reading about it, and I'm like, holy crap, this stuff like is meant to completely shut down your fertility like it's it's meant to like turn off fertility in like dogs or something <laughs> and like like to and i'm like reading about it more and it's like a serious suppressor suppressing effect and it's like so strong that you're not supposed to take it for longer than like a week because it's so toxic on the liver and i'm reading about how powerful it is and it's like way stronger than trend and it's just something that you're really you know not supposed to do much of like check drops and I just chickened out too much on taking it, but my buddy, I'm like, he like he would take anything. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, no, you can try it out. And uh, he thought it was like a SARM. He didn't know it was like an actual steroid. So he's like taking this stuff and he's getting crazy strong, but he's like, man, I cannot sleep at all. I don't sleep at all during the night. I feel terrible. I, I, I can't fall asleep till six. I just feel awful all day, but I'm getting really strong. I'm like, you know, like, Trestolone's like a steroid. It's not a SARM. And he's like, what, what, really? I thought it was a SARM. I'm like, no, dude, it's freaking, it's like a really powerful, the most powerful steroid. And he had no idea, and it just was, like, killing him. And he's like, dude, I had no idea I was taking it. And he had to stop. Like, he, this was a guy who could take 700 milligrams of Trent Ace and not even blink, and he just felt fine. He's like, I feel good. But as soon as he took, like, two weeks of Trestolone, 
he felt like trash. Like he felt he <laughs> couldn't sleep a wink, felt completely toxic. And his strength went way up, but it's kind of funny that like it kind of puts into perspective of how strong it is to where a guy who took 700 migs a week of Trent Ace yeah. was unbothered by that, but Trest alone was so strong that he couldn't even handle it. Wow. That's where I, I would just give him all the stuff that I was too scared to take. It's like, it's like, it's like I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to let you do it. So no, we had people like that too. It's like, here, try this. I was at the Arnold once. This, this guy, he had a pro hormone company. He had this pro hormone. He's like, this is my strongest one. Like, I don't know this guy, but he knows who I am. He like stops me and pulls me over. He's like, I'm going to give you this. And it was like free $120 bottle of this stuff. It was three pro hormones and three SARMs in one. And I'm like, this is some crazy stuff, dude. This is, like, I took it to be nice and everything, and I was, like, way too terrified to take it after that. I'm like, this is nuts, dude. Three pro hormones and three SARMs in one. Yeah, so who'd you give it to and how'd it work? Same guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know if he ever actually took it, but I was like, this is going to, this the liver toxicity of this must be insane. I'm, I'm, I'm like, three pro hormones all in one? No, I'm, I'm good. Well, what would, I mean, th th that brings up so many questions as such as what would be the point, you know, and all this other stuff. So I can imagine it probably would have gotten me stupid strong. But even at that point, I was in my like later 20s and I was starting to draw a line of like, yeah, I don't know. This is getting kind of dicey. But if he had given me that at like 22, yeah, psh, I would, you know, taking it. No problem. <laughs> <It's just> so, <laughs> no, wait a minute. So, I mean, you're only talking a few years difference here. Yeah. What changes when that, so how's the lying change over three years at that age? Okay. So like 22 to like, let's say 28. Yeah. So six years. I, I, I think what I saw was I still felt invincible at 22. And then at like 28, I'd seen a bunch of guys start passing mm -hmm. and I could actually feel times where I was like, Oh, this isn't good. Like that last halo cycle where I was on, the the um the gram and a half a test and the gram of npp and the halo the 40 megs of halo which is way too much i felt off like i felt like oh gosh you know something's mm -hmm. bad here like my blood pressure would shoot up i'd have these crazy headaches and uh i'd feel insanely nauseous where i would you know i talked about if i stood up i'd feel like i'm gonna throw up so i started feeling like man this stuff is is potent whereas at like 22 i don't know if i was so new to it the uh, the side effects weren't as pronounced, and I, I felt okay still. Mm -hmm. So I think it was more that coupled with seeing guys like actually start passing, where I'm, I started to get a little more hesitant of just taking whatever. But I mean, well, I say that, and I was taking three grams, but you know, I don't know. It was. Yeah. It was I think too, as I got older, I leaned more into injectables than orals because orals are when you really feel like trash. Oh yeah. I never felt crappy on injectables like I did on orals. So I only used orals before, it was just like a month before. I used to have this rhyme, you know, before a meet, you, you lower the tab or you lower the jabs yeah. and up the tabs. You know, it's just based upon half-life, it makes sense. You know, like what exactly is, you know, testosterone ethanate going to do for you the week before a meet? Fucking yeah, it's a good point. Do dick, you know, but orals will. So let's just trade those milligrams <laughs> with the orals and then, you know, run it that way and push where as far as dose mitigation that it wasn't people passing when i was coming through it was seeing them get hurt yep like muscle tears and shit like that and it was it always seemed to be like okay there's whatever the weird there's normal tears then there's weird ones right yeah. there's for like a quad tear bicep tear pec tear kind of like normal tears like, okay what was he taking and then eh, normal then there'd be like weird shit like their lat tore off or they tore their fucking ab off their pubic bone or some shit. And then it was some ridiculous amount where it was that always seemed to correlate like the weird fucking tears, even the even the regular ones still kind of correlated, but not as much. The weird ones, you'd always dig in. And then if they were telling you the truth, which is rare, you know, even today, everybody's on TRT. Nobody's taking more than fucking 200 milligrams of right, maybe 300, but goddamn, you know, they're taking a gram, but that's TRT. Yeah. You know, so that's the new lie, right? Oh, the, the old yeah, lie was right. just by lie by omission. Now the new lie is lie by dose. This is worse. I'm like, oh, just, <laughs> I, I freaking hate that garbage. That pisses me off. I'm like, I'm like, you guys just put it out there. Gosh, I just, I know what they're doing because I did it. And I'm like, stop, just stop. Yeah.
Like, come on, guys. We all did it. We, I, I know what you're doing. You're telling me you never got the H to push the envelope. BS, man. Like, I, I just... That gets me riled up. That's not nah, if, if, if I could put anything out there as a defense for them, it would be the same defense that people had by lying by omission. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? If they always say that, then if they have a prescription, then they're not legally doing anything wrong. Right? Because the prescription may be for 200 or maybe for 400 or something like that. But sometimes it's like, it's, it's not necessary. Like, you don't even have to say anything. Just leave it be. Just let people assume that you're taking a gram or two or whatever just let them you don't when they go out of their way i guess is what i'm saying when they go out of their way to say oh yeah it's just trt or whatever it is it's like dude come on you're trying too hard yeah yeah nobody cares first off so just fucking let it be and nobody's gonna say oh my god look at him he's only taken one cc a test like whatever it's like he's only done he only does one hit of heroin a day instead of 10 like yeah, what's like the fucking difference <laughs> no i mean that's per, that's a really good point i mean have, did you have a lot of those uh one thing that would happen especially with the older gear when it wasn't as good like now the gear's better quality even if you get it underground it's a lot better quality but back then there wasn't as much and it was a lot sketchier i would get these bad shots like it would happen mm -hmm. all the time where you do a normal shot just like always and something would go wrong um and so for the next week you can't move right you can't reach the bar on deadlift like you can't deadlift for a week because what do you mean what do you mean like scar tissue or just like muscle tightness what are you talking about so here? let's say a glute shot that goes wrong like everything's normal um and then maybe the next day you wake up and you can barely move like it's it's swollen it's it's there's like a you know it's it's swollen up and it's locked up oh yeah like it's hitting your sciatica and now your back's all fucked up and your legs are fucked up yeah like like these shots like something would be in them that cause a massive amount of inflammation there'd be um maybe the, the gear wasn't as clean as it should be and then next thing you know you can't bend your leg you can't reach the deadlift bar you can't squat down so like your lower body lifts are out for a week i had that happen so many times quad shots would go wrong a lot I quit doing quads entirely. I did too. I hate quads. I, I thought I was going to lose my leg one time. Yep. You know, just terrible. Terrible. Cool. I don't know anyone does quad shots. There's so many nerves in there. So much can go wrong. It was bad. It's, I got a funny story with that one too. Is for some, it's always a stupid reason because it's not like I had to because I'm not, I'm not taking that much shit. So say at the time it might have been three syringes a week total so i mean yeah i'm sure for some people that's a lot but for me back then we're not talking yeah. a whole lot right so it's not like i couldn't have done dealt dealt glute glute you know but for some fucking reason i'm like okay i'm gonna go quad you know and so i hit and it felt weird you know it's like it hurts you're like oh fuck okay whatever and then it starts to get red right so it's like that burning type of thing and so I take a picture and I get a hold of my doctor. I'm like, dude, I took this fucking shot. And he's like, you need to, um, you need to put heat on it, I think is what he said. So I put like moist heat on the thing you put in the microwave and shit like that. So I put that on there. Now keep in mind, it's red and it's hot to begin with. So I, I keep putting, putting heat on that thing. And after doing that for a day, the next day my leg is burn man it's all red it's fucking like i'm blistered and shit i'm like what the fuck you know so now i go to see him and he's like what the fuck and i'm like he's like this looks like there's bacteria eating its way from the inside out like you know we need to get this looked at you might lose your leg i mean i'm like what i'm like freaking the fuck out now and what it ended up being was i i burnt my leg with the, oh with, the, with the pad because I couldn't feel how hot it was because it always hurt, right? So I kept applying to try to make it feel better, but it always felt burning. So I had like a fucking whatever degree burn that was on there. So then once he realized that and then we treated it as a burn, I still couldn't walk for three weeks and had to have a compress. And I'm like, after that, fuck it. Then the fight, here's the other shit with that. Once that starts getting better, it moves down your leg. Right. So then now your knee hurts like a motherfucker because all the swelling goes into your knee. Then it went down into my shin and hurts like a motherfucker. This was like a six week fucking nightmare for two cc's of some fucking lore balling or something that wasn't even worth it in the first place. That was pretty funny. Yeah. yeah we, I feel like we've all had those bad 
experiences with the shots. Yeah, that I burned myself. That was the worst. That was the worst. There, here's a here's a stupid question for you, but it's one that's worth asking because it's fun. It's fun. You ever have the geysers? So you shoot oh, it in God, there. Yeah. You, so okay. So yeah. what, what do you do? Because like two cc's of your shit just left out your ass, do you have to take another shot or just roll with it? I rolled with it, but I would have those every once in a while. Yeah, so this is kind of interesting, guys, because this this wasn't very common, but we've all been there. I probably had it happen, you know, a dozen times. You'd pin your glute, especially. It was always the glute. And uh, just like normal, nothing out of, the, out of the ordinary. And as soon as you pull the, the syringe out, like blood would just shoot out across the room. And it like doused the wall. And it wasn't... I mean, it wasn't a ton, but it was just like... Psh, psh, it was out. enough to make it look like somebody got hurt. Yeah, it was kind of crazy, and those happened quite a bit. No, this wasn't, like, painful, but it was really weird. And, uh, yeah, I had that happen quite a few times. But I always took another shot. Cause okay, I, I just I, went with it. I was like, all right, whatever. I figured I blew my shit out. Like, if I put three cc's in, that had to be two. That's how I thought about it, right? So Yeah, it's possible. I, I never thought yeah. much. I just rolled with it, but... But it did, like, because it would get on, like, the white bathroom walls and oh, yeah. shit. So it was a mess. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, did you ever get trend cough? Yes, I've had that a couple it's times. It's not that bad. It's not that bad, but there were a couple times I was concerned and would get in, like, a cold bath. Because I'm like, yeah. I need to do something. I don't, I don't know why I thought that was going to make any difference. You know, it's like, this don't feel right. Like, I don't, I have no idea why. Well, but... There was a trend cough hack I read about, and it worked. So I would always do that. So every time I'd pin trend, I'd have eight ounces of water next to me. And they're like, as soon as you feel that in the back of your throat, you feel it coming on, slam the glass of water, like drink it, and it stops it. Mine wasn't so much like the cough. I would get like the cough. It was like this weird fucking feeling, like this weird heart type of feeling. Oh, yeah. That was like, like you, and that's what was freaking me okay. out. Like, okay, like what the fuck? Like my yeah. heart rate's real high. So that's why I probably now it makes sense. That's I'm thinking if I get in a cold bath, maybe it will bring my heart rate down. Just something's fucked up, you know, and then it would go away. Because the, the whole time you're like, I'm never doing this. I, I'm never doing this again. Right. Then like 10 minutes later. Yeah. Cool. Here, it you're, goes away and you're like, okay, I'm all right. Yeah. You're on the way to the gym. You're fucking fine. Did you ever have the thing where I'm trying to figure out, I don't know if I've ever talked about this, but <laughs> These are fucked up I'm stories. like, no, did anyone else have this, this issue where I don't, it was when I was on gear. So it has to be correlated because I never got it, you know, in recent years, but I would be doing squats like high bar and I would get done with them. And like my chest area would be like weirdly sore for like a week. Like, like internally though, not like the muscles. It was like something inside of here and it would either be on the right side or the left side. And it would kind of, sometimes it'd be left, sometimes it would be right, but it was like in you. It was like your lungs or something were like sore. It was jacked up and I would get it from high bar squats. No, I can't, I can't remember anything like that. I'm like, that, that can't be good. I remember things kind of like that from like strip sets on leg presses that are just stupid, you know, things like that where I thought I broke something, like I broke my heart. You know, I thought yeah. something happened, but it would, again, it would go away and it'd be fine. Well, this would last for like a week to where it was kind of hard to breathe. I was like, what in the heck is going on? And it would only be from squats, but it was like, it wasn't the muscle. Like you could feel it was something, mm -hmm. lungs or heart. It was weird. It was kind I had of weird shit that would be more rib oriented. Okay. You know, a little bit lower where it'd be like, what the fuck? And I, we would just say you have a rib out, whatever that fucking means, you know. And, yeah, and, I've heard <laughs> and you know, put a put another belt over your ribs next time you squat it, and then a week later it'd be fine. It would go away. And that's what those Vallejo Velcro belts oh, yeah, were for. Yeah, yeah. So you'd have your regular belt, then you put that over there because you had a rib out. Um, God, there was a time when Chuck had ribs out or whatever it was, and. It was before one of the meets, and so he would have, he had three belts on it. It was like three belts. And with the monolift, we had, to, it's a monolift, right? So you're already, we, we'd have to take it out of the monolift and set it, you know, on his back. Then he would do a set and we'd have to set it back in his back, you know, back into the monolift for him to, and there were, there was, there, I think it was three, it was two belts and like knee wraps, like oh the whole torso was like all wrapped up and 
looking back, it's fucked up. But at the time, it was like normal. It's like, okay, whatever. There's a meet two weeks away. This is what he's got to do. Yeah. But looking back, it's like, this was dumb as fuck. Like, he probably should have just not rested. Yeah. And would have been better. Oh, my God. You know, for the meet. But that was, just, that, was, that was one of the times where I can remember most of us were like, this is probably not a good idea. You know, uh-huh. but fuck it, you do it. So we talked about earlier. You justify a lot of things. You're like, yeah, it's fine. Um, and I did that for so many things that would feel off. Where I'm like, yeah, it's just part of the game. I'm all right. Um, whether it's medically and you know something like that, or whether it's just like a muscle tear, you're just like, yeah, it's part of the game. Mm-hmm. Let's keep rolling. So a different mindset where we uh, overlooked a lot of those things that were like, oh, this is a red flag. Yeah, it's a problem. I wonder sometimes if it's necessary though, right? Cause you think back and I'm sure you pulled a lot of times where your hamstrings were a little jacked up, Oh yeah. you know, but you're doing it any, even if they were a lot jacked up, you're still doing it. Yeah. The you know, time I went to Mark Bell's, I had my hamstring was purple and blue, the whole hamstring. And I'm like, I'm still going to try the 900. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do? Like you're, you're scheduled out for this big event. And I'm like, I'm not going to skip it because my hamstring, and it was like fully bruised down the back end. I'm like, I got to try it. You know, that was just part of the game. So I tried. Uh, Yes, I believe so. And I think that those are the things when you look back on, you're like, yeah, sketchy. But at the same time, I know, you know, everybody else knows. Nobody was going to talk you out of it. No. You're still doing it. Um, The only question I have looking back at shit like that was, was it necessary? My answer is physically, no. Mentally, yes. Correct. Right? So there's there's a split answer. You know, would it have been better to skip that day physically? Sure. But mentally, you got to wonder because that kind of, in my mind, means I quit. Then if I quit, then it's going to be easier, in my mind, to do it next time. And if it's easier to do it next time, then it's going to be easy for me to quit halfway through the lift when I need to keep pulling further than everybody else would because i still believe like on a deadlift (laughs) you know that the only reason you miss is because you fucking quit you quit pulling that right and now i get it you're still gonna miss it but you still at some point had to mentally decide i'm setting it down this is how my brain operates (laughs) uh, that's what i love about deadlift deadlift to me a lot of it is intensity so it's like you weren't intense enough. In my opinion, I'm like, a lot of times if someone is like, oh, I don't know, my back feels off, I'm like, screw that. There is no fear on a deadlift. You wanna be good at deadlift? Get rid of that fear. You cannot lift big weights with fear. You have to get rid of it. You have to ignore it. You have to get it out of your brain. Like, you're not gonna pull, to your, you're not gonna lift your maximum weights that you're capable of if you're hesitant, if you go in like, I don't know, I'm worried about this. It's like, screw that, turn that crap off. It's time to go. There is no place for that. You want to lift what you're capable of. You got to get that crap out of your brain, and it's it's go time. There is no thought to the consequences. Okay, like I I did jack my back up a little last Friday trying 650, mm-hmm. and I knew I wasn't rested, but I was like, you know what? I want to do it. Screw it. I'm turning that part of my brain off, and I'm going for it. Okay, so I went for it, and I paid for it, and it's it's healing up now. It's I know it goes away, but you cannot go into that with fear or you know being timid. There's no place for that. Well, I think that's part of the mindset that a lot of people miss is because before you actually decide to approach the bar, you may have thought for a second, I shouldn't do this. But then your other part of your mind says, what the fuck are you doing? And then you have this inner battle, right? And then you don't go to the bar until that inner battle has been solved. No, you turn it off. You have to be... When it comes to the lift that the weight is in front of you, whatever it is, it could be a squat. Squats are very intimidating a lot of times. You turn it off and you're all in. You're locked in on the weight and you're gonna try it no matter what the consequences because you've decided at that point that I'm rolling with it. That's where you gotta be at. You can't go in half-assing it to where you're like, I don't know. It's like, my lifts all, my squat went to crap when I had an injury, when I had the quad tear with the 783, 783. Um, at Boss of Bosses, it was the third attempt. I tore my vastus lateralis at the bottom. And after that, I saw um, Mark Miller at an RPS meet, like tear his, both his quad tendons with 800 pounds. And after I saw that and had just experienced the quad tear myself, I started getting really timid with squats, where I was like really in my head, I was all nervous, and I never was squatted the same again. 
because it's like it was like a it was like a fighter who gets knocked out and they've never been knocked out mm -hmm. before you haven't gotten knocked out you have no fear of that once you felt like crap i got knocked out you're always more conservative you're playing you're worried about it and and it was the same way with me so i don't have that fear on deadlifts even with back issues disc issues i never have it but squat still gets in my head sometimes yeah well the the point i'm trying to make is a lot of people struggle or they try to find an answer to a mindset that's not there because they think you know as we're talking we've never doubted the lift that we are going to go up to do which maybe we did for a second before we decided to actually go do it that day right but then when you you get to a point where it's, it's turned off you're like fuck it this then there's no other choice but to sit there and say with not every lift you do this. I mean, most lifts you should have the confidence, but with a lot of the lifts for most of the bigger lifters, there's always a little bit of lack of confidence before they actually decide to turn it off and this is what they're gonna do. I think a lot of other lifters have that and then they think that they shouldn't because nobody else does, or the perception is nobody else does. And that's not true. Everybody else does. They just find a way to pivot, turn it off, get aggressive, tune it out, whatever they need to do to find the confidence to go through it. And um, I think that's what limits a lot of them because they sit there while they're on deck or whatever it is, five minutes out, like, you know, just feel, you know, it's normal, right? Actually, for most of us, we're gonna distract ourselves fucking talking to other people and just not even worry about it. And then, or fake it with overconfidence, whatever then comes that point that you're talking about it it's off it's gone there's no other thing and some people don't get that i think you're right though you're, you're spot on because it is there it is present the nerves and maybe the fear to an extent are there for everybody and there's this moment maybe in the 10 15 seconds before the actual lift where you flip it off and you say no matter what happens, I'm committing to trying this the best to the best of my ability, and I'm not going to be afraid of it right now. So I think it's a very quick uh, thing that happens right before mm -hmm. the lift, and that's where you want to get to. It's not to say you're not going to be a little nervous. The weight, if the weight's making you nervous, is probably a good thing. Yes. Like you're you're lifting your capabilities. Um, you should respect the weight to that degree, but you have to get to a point where you commit to the lift. You're flipping the the noise off and you're just gonna go for it. And that's how every heavy squat was for me at a meet. I was, you know, there was fear putting almost 800 pounds on my back with freaking knee sleeves. Like, it's scary. It is scary. You feel it. You, you've seen what can happen. You know there could be consequences, but at some point you just say, I have to do this and I'm gonna try and I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a shot. Mm -hmm. And that's the key. I didn't ever face that with bench because the bench weights just weren't heavy enough. Like I was a negative a bencher, so 463 even was not that intimidating. But my squat weights were up there to where you know 770 plus. You're getting to where it's like it's starting to get a little dicey. But I never had that fear on bench just because to me 463 was nothing when I was seeing guys doing 500 plus. Yeah, I had to deal with the bench because I tore my pec off, and it was at the top. You know, so it was there oh, and it, it came back on me, yeah. and that that took a while to to figure out how to manage that one, right? Because I can get psyched up and tuned out and all the other kind of shit, but it wasn't, it was, the aggression only worked for so long, then that wasn't working, then other things weren't working, and then it was, you're in your head, like I need to make sure I'm stable in the right spot when I start, otherwise my elbow goes out too much and there's too much tension on there. And um, so I just flipped it and start visualizing myself, you know, with both tear, pec tears, you know, bringing it down, tearing off, bar hitting my head, fucking blood all over the place. And I scared the fuck out. I put myself in such a fear state that when I got there, all I wanted is the bar the fuck off of me. And then that worked, man, it worked like a motherfucker. It worked big time. And my bench speed, everything went through the roof. I mean, it worked until it didn't. Then I realized, fuck, I'm not scared anymore. Then it became another battle. So you always got to find a battle. Like, what is the battle now where I have to figure this out? Then it's like, okay. Then with that one, it was, I'm just going to act like, as stupid as it sounds, no matter what's on the bar, I'm going to act like it's 100 pounds left. 
So if it was 585 and I got it, I'm holding it out there. I'm like, fuck, this is only 485. Wow. Right. And then that worked. You know, so you, I'm, you always find a different strategy yeah. to be able to deal with it. You know, the deadlift I fucking hated. So that was just a whole different. I had to be relaxed. Unlike a lot of you guys, I had to be very relaxed because I don't want to say it's because I wasn't built to. If I got a little out of the groove, I was fucked. So it's just, it's, I, I joke and say to me, it just became that one last thing you had to do before you went to dinner. You know, so I just, I had to not get jacked up. I had to not get fired up. I just had to be fucking relaxed, which makes sense because it lowered my shoulders. It lowered my hands. It put myself in a better position to pull. Otherwise I was, you know, you're like, you're too tense, you know? And um, had I had more time and been able to figure out how to become aggressive in that relaxed state, that would have been fun. That would have been interesting. That was the one thing I wish I would have been able to, because it takes a long time to figure a lot of this shit out. Oh, yeah, it takes a decade. <laughs> That's how bench was for me. Bench was like, I'm going to be relaxed. I'm just going to go in, focus on technique, no aggression, because I suck at bench relative mm -hmm. to everything else. Deadlift was like autopilot, turn everything off, get intense, get amped up. And then squat was almost the in-between where I'm like, I have to be amped up to put this weight on my back but i also have to be cued in and calm enough to like really be focused so it was more of an in-between with squat but squat was the only one where i ever can say there was fear i didn't really have fear on deadlift i mean what goes wrong you pop your back you put yeah. the bar down bench the weights like i said were not heavy enough 463 isn't scary to me um and then squat was just like this is this is some big boy weight so it was it was getting up there and that's where i felt the fear now well the scariest ones you see are squats yeah somebody blows out their acl their uh, quad yeah. tendon patella tendon yeah we've all seen it um we've seen it in person and online and it's just like it's hard to uh to be the next guy up. <laughs> oh no it's hard like, to unsee you know it's like what the hell you know it's there's who was it I was talking to somebody about this and it was a, it was a, somebody that was following somebody that something like that happened. And cause a lot of times most, most lifters, and I'm pretty certain about this, they, they pull like it happens and they're just, you know what? Cool. Third attempt to, you know, they're, but I remember it happened. Somebody I was talking to, this happened to somebody on the first attempt and the way that they framed it in their brain was if I don't go do this, then I'm not going to change the momentum for everybody else in this meet. So right now, the momentum for this place is dead. You know, it sucks. You know, I have to do this to change that. And I thought, you know, that's, that's an interesting take there because now it becomes more than just about that one person. But, you know, you, you feel like a superhero. Like now I can go save the day for everybody else's squat because somebody has to change this. Because that you've seen meets, you know, that momentum starts to shift one way. It, it fucks up a lot of people. But usually there is one or two guys that will change it. You know, yep. that, that one PR is like, then everybody's like, okay, cool. You know, somebody fucking did something good here. Maybe I can too. And then it, it changes that thing. It's interesting because it's an individual sport. But momentum can change the same way like you can see in a football game or something like that. Yeah, it changes the whole vibe in the room. So I've been at big meets where that's happened, where everybody's missing in their thirds, and then, you know, somebody pulls through and everything kind of turns around. So yeah. that's definitely a thing. Very interesting. Yeah, I don't Man. <laughs> Crazy stuff from the days. Yes, with... When you were out here last time... You know, I had some notes down here, and we kind of hit all of them. Were there were there any things that you, you we didn't cover that you wanted to cover? No, I mean I don't think too much. It's just like I said, it's just um, I'm kind of pivoting, but the strength base is always there now. So that's just what's different with my life. Um, so it's kind of funny. I was I was joking earlier. I'm like, last time I was here, I'm wearing two XL shirt. Now large, large. So it's like. I went down two shirt sizes, but I, I, I feel smaller, but it's, it's good. I feel healthy. So. Is it though? 
Uh, it's it's. I mean, we got to grab a large, right? Now, I know what you're talking about because I've gone from a two X to an XL a couple times. I don't know what I think about that. It's like this. <laughs> it's like in a shirt, you do not look impressive, but like without a shirt, you look impressive. So it's it's that thing you see where you see these guys online and you're like, they they look amazing without a shirt, but if you were standing next to them, it look like nothing. They don't look like just a guy who kind of works out. Mm -hmm. And that's just the change in it. But I feel good, so that's the main thing. And I'm just gonna keep rolling because gotta have a pursuit yeah. at all times. Well, I think that's the biggest takeaway from the whole thing is you found that next thing challenge yeah. that next challenge where last time we talked you were kind of seeking it yeah you know, i was you, lost yeah i mean you were in, i've been in the same place you're trying to find it in health markers which is fucked up right because they're important and they're fun to watch but they're not real fucking satisfying no. it's not like when you hit a pr and vitamin d you're like wow yeah i fucking you know I'm, it's not <laughs> the same you know, where having that thing out there to train for changes everything. Yeah, and you have to go through that struggle. Like, we need that struggle, that, that difficult thing that scares us, like you said. If it's not scary, it's not enough. If it's not something that's going to take a prolonged effort. Not, not, I'm not talking like two months around. I'm talking a year or more of just buckling down and getting after it. And I needed that. I needed that discipline. The discipline is what, what drives me, so... I have that now. I have this pursuit that's really, really challenging, and something I'm, I wasn't good at naturally, and that's kind of that's kind of driving me. So that's where I'm at. You've done. When I was looking at your YouTube earlier, you've done YouTube, Zooms, podcasts, whatever you want to call it. It's um, quite a few. So you started doing that more frequently over the past year, and um, or has it been the last? Oh God! It's I, yeah. what's the name of it? Because the name cracked me up. Actually, well, I I I, had, I was using the name for a while and then I just kind of dropped it. But it was uh, a buddy of mine came up with it, the Knowledge Pharmacy. Yes, that's yes, so that's like what that's crazy. what caught my attention because I mean, so the Knowledge Pharmacy, and if I'm being completely honest, I'm not looking at the dates of all them. I'm just looking at all the guests that are on there, and then it brought a question up to my head because it's, I have a lot of guests that come out on the podcast with all these people that you've been speaking to. What are commonalities that that you see, that you've seen amongst the the higher performers that you're speaking to, because there's certain things that stand out amongst them, and what it's different. You, you've you've done these, so you know it's different when you do a podcast because you you kind of get to know people on a different level yep. than if you're just seeing them in a meet or talking to them or just training with them in the gym. So you get to see a little different layers to be able to say, okay, this this is common. You know, this is universal amongst all of them. What have you found with those? I'd say one thing that stands out is they don't view. The, the sacrifices they make to achieve their goal is a big deal. So their lifestyle choices to put in that amount of work um, to do things that others may deem as crazy, they just view it as normal. Like they're just like, oh yeah, so what, I gotta do that. I gotta train for four hours a day or I gotta wake up at this hour or do this. And they do it every single freaking day and they just view it as like normal. They're, they're, they don't blink, you know, blink at it. They don't think this is some, extremely difficult thing for them it's just like the norm so their norm becomes the everyday lifestyle that leads to that that greatness that that level they just it's routine it's habitual it's not a big deal so if, if you're making a big deal out of it to where it's like you really have to pump yourself up every day to do it you might not be that successful at it but when it just becomes normal for you it's like just another day and you're just doing it over and over that's where the the major success really comes from what I've seen with guys. It just becomes their normal, their everyday life. Now, with you being on the other side of it, you have a different perspective like I have too. So you can look at it and see where they're all abnormal, right? And because we probably still are, but you know, were and are. And um, what do you see there? That's the commonalities amongst where they're a little off. Uh, just their viewpoints on, on what's extreme and what's not, you know? <laughs> I mean, I've talked to guys where you're like, dude, are you kidding me right now? And you think it's so extreme, but to them, they don't. Like, they genuinely don't. 
whether that's the amount of weight on the bar, um, it's not intimidating to them. Like major accomplishments that we would deem so insane or impossible, they don't view as any big deal. It's like very nonchalant about these sort of things to where they're not trying to impress anyone to them. It's just what is normal and their normal is skewed. That's the big thing. The amount of weight they're lifting, it's very skewed. Or I've even talked and talking, talked to guys in like the endurance side of things the 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 speeds they can run or the things they do on a daily basis they're just like yeah, it's just normal whereas you're looking at it like what the hell dude that's insane um and uh you know jesus Oliveras, like he squats thousand plus raw like he uh to him it's just no big deal a thousand pounds like yeah whatever it's just another day at the office and they just chip away at it um and just becomes part of their lifestyle it's their passion it's i think that's the other thing if it's really your passion you're going to be pretty good at it you're going to be able to pursue it but you can't fake your way through passion if you really don't like something you're probably not going to end up that great at it because the passion's not there every one of these guys has a base of passion for what they're doing you can't fake passion it's either there or it's not so if i'm not as passionate about something i'm not going to be as good at it i'm not going to be as successful that's kind of the thing where I think a lot of people try to fake passion. They try to say, oh, I want to be good at this, so I'm going to do it. But they don't really love it. They don't live it. These guys freaking live it. It's who they are. It's a part of their identity. It becomes them. And that, that's the big difference. What do you think crosses that barrier between those that fake it and those that live it? Do they have, does it have to be tested? Man, it's a tough question. I mean, like... Because the, the reason I put that out there is because I, I know exactly what you're talking about, and I've, I've thought on it, and the only thing I could ever come up with is you can usually tell the ones that are faking it because as soon as they get hurt, they're done, right? That's true. But some of the guys that you're talking about have still never been hurt, but they still have all that passion. You know, so I don't know if that's my answer or okay. not, right? You see what I'm saying? That's yeah. the caveat to my answer because it sounds right until you think of, now there's a lot of people that are relatively injury free, but still have, unless it's being tested in some other way. You know, I don't, but there is a big, there's a big difference between what you're talking about. And I don't think the people who are faking it realize what the difference is. I would say... I would say it more comes down to the best way to assess it would be someone who's been in the game a long time, the amount of years in the game, and where they started to where they are now. I don't feel like you're going to get to necessarily crazy elite numbers if you aren't passionate. Um, so you can get pretty strong. Where you, you could go in any average gym in America and be the strongest guy, and and you could still not be that passionate about it. But to get to like a really high level. I think you gotta have some passion for it. Even if you're not, you haven't been injured, you haven't faced that adversity, um, just the consistency. So I think it's more the consistency and discipline is where I see the passion come out. I think discipline, discipline plays in, resonates with me because I can see that from being able to do the things that you know need to be done to become better, but you don't wanna do them, right? So it's, exactly. there's, there's a, I've joked about this for, three years now there's a lot of people that will say that they're all in like they're all in you know to powerlifting or whatever it is but yet they'll never try to learn anything more about training than what the whatever their coach sends them each week like so you're all in so you're just going to trust what one guy may or may not know but you're not looking at anything else to see if you're leaving anything on the table so you say that's not all in so you're all in but you're not going to go down the nutrition rabbit hole just to see not saying that you need to eat clean all the time but you haven't even tried to see if that would make a difference that's what i mean yeah, yeah. you're right because why do you think i worked with justin harris yes that was way out of my wheelhouse <laughs> like that was um, very uncomfortable because it was way outside of my wheelhouse it was super structured it was pushing me to but I, I went down that rabbit hole like yeah you're trying all these different things because you want to see what's going to give you the next little bit of edge and i had to start exploring that when i couldn't just rely on peds anymore because you get the bump for a while from peds like we talked about where that alone is going to wipe out a lot of the problems you're going to progress but eventually that stops working as well either and then you've got to really like figure out your programming your nutrition and that kind of in the later years is where i had to really dial that in 
and see everything else. So it, it's it's you can get away with a lot initially with PEDs, but eventually you, to maximize everything, you got to really like find all the little things that the loose ends and tie them up. Yeah. So kind of what we have to blend that with what we were talking about earlier, you're still going to have to do it. Yeah, to learn. You're either gonna have to do it at the front end, or you're gonna have to do it at the back end. 100. percent right? And if, if it's better to do it at the front end because the back end is gonna be better and you know more riding the wave than than the other, you know. But I can't say because I did too soon, you know. So, so I'm yeah. speaking from a fucked up. You know, we're both speaking from the opposite mindset where we need somebody sitting here that did it how we think you should do it properly like yeah, yeah. i think that's that's basically what we see with john hack yeah yeah john hack's Good the point. example of the guy who um did it in the right order yeah yeah and he figured out the nutrition i know he's very serious with his nutrition he figured out the training he won ipf worlds naturally got to the top level in his weight class and then he jumped on the pds and he did it slowly so i feel like he was the he's the one who's the example of look at the potential when you maximize things in the proper order no, and I that's think like you just nailed it. Yeah, that's yeah. the guy. Like, yeah, but yet yeah, that will get lost in people saying, "Well, he's the genetic outlier." We'll set that aside. But he's, was, yeah, he's a freak. But like, I remember meeting him. I mean, we we hung out a ton and trained. We were all in that same area. But he really just did it in a patient manner, and so, no one yeah. has patience for that. Yes, he's more patient than everybody else. That's why he's the best. Oh, no, I agree. I, I, no, I agree. I agree. One hundred percent. You know, that's John is yeah. a lifter. John is a patient guy, patient with his training as far as his progression. Like all of us, like, oh, I want to max out. I want to go. John's like, he'll just stick to the freaking book and just slowly ramp it and stick to his program and peak at the right time. And he'll wait to take the PEDs and get as strong as he can naturally and get his diet dialed in and does it like all the, right in the perfect order. And it's look like where, ridiculously, look where he is. yeah, yes. Meticulous, methodical. Yeah. Meticulous and methodical. And it's if if that's if that's the top example, let's just say perfect. People don't have to be perfect, but they need to strive for that. You know. I don't know why everyone doesn't copy his blueprint. I'm like mm -hmm. I know, but I know at that age you don't want to. You want to just go for it. And you oh man, the drug thing, man. I have fucking 14 year olds and 30. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's crazy the shit. You know how early they're being introduced to all this and how normalized you know and it's it's good and bad like i see both sides of the whole thing but it's like fuck you know and it's thankfully there's examples like that you know you can put out there and say well look here's how he did it and he's you know best in the world right now so it doesn't hurt but, when he's the best in the world I, but i'm like guys if i were your age at 15 again or whatever i'd be like okay i'm gonna study everything john's done and copy it blueprint it because that's how you learn we learn like in any endeavor look at the guy who's where who's done what you want to do and where you want to be use him as a mentor use him as your example there's nothing wrong with that mm -hmm. that's that's what successful people smart people do is they they look at somebody who's where they want to be and they they study it they study what they did 10 years ago they study what they're doing now and they figure it out and try to copy that blueprint that's what you should do that's what i would do if i were a young guy and I was like, okay, I want to be John Hack. I'm going to follow that blueprint. Yeah. So. Any closing thoughts? No, I mean, I think that. That was pretty strong. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that, that comes through pretty good. I covered a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for being out again. It was, it was great. Um, thank you guys for listening. And yeah, thank you. All his listening. contact information is in the description. Um, would you rather them hit you up on Instagram or YouTube? Um, yeah, just just hit me up on YouTube. Find my YouTube. That's the main place. Um, just type my name in. You'll find me. No, I it's keep easy it to find. That's pretty I easy keep to it find. Simple. Just, the, the reason I put that out there is because it's there's so many different channels people are using now yeah, that I don't know what... I'm pretty boring. Well, I don't know it's what people are trying to drive. I want to drive people yeah. to where you want them to go. YouTube. You know, so the YouTube would be where to go. So hit his YouTube channel, hit him up, keep up with him, um, learn from him, and also go back and learn from the stuff that he did in the past. Appreciate you being out. Appreciate Thank you, you guys. Out, We're done. <laughs>